Opla, and welcome to Opla, a One Piece live action podcast from the people at the One Piece podcast, talking all about the One Piece live action series for Netflix streaming with real life people on it. They made us call it Opla. Yeah. They didn't like our our, uh, our idea. What was our idea again? Uh, there was several bad ones. Uh, one I could think of uh, that I think had potential was I Want Alive. <laughs> just a crying Robin, just desperately wanting a One Piece live action series. Don't we all? Or as Jim Bay once said, to eat is to live. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I hate me too. Um, hi, everybody. Hi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of us. <laughs> I'm Steve. I'm Vero. And we're going to be your hosts. We're the ones going through this series on this podcast. Not episode by episode. We're going to do kind of by like story arcs. This first episode, we cover the first two episodes of the series. But also, we'll be featuring some other segments, uh, such as some interviews. And Zach and the gang were kind enough to conduct an interview with the composers of the One Piece live action series. Uh, that are um, that would be Sonia Belusova and Giona Ostinelli. Nailed it. Thank you. That's the quarter Italian in me. Maybe. <laughs> but yeah, it's a fun interview. Uh, definitely check that out as well. And definitely look forward to the rest of this series as we cover One Piece, but with real life people instead. Streaming. On Netflix. On Netflix. Get your mom to watch it. Sure. Get get all the people that said, mm-hmm, it's too long. <laughs> well, get your normie coworkers to watch yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, no, it'll be fun to talk about because it seems like it is the, uh, you know, the entry point now for uh, a lot of people and uh, it's had a pretty positive response. So mm-hmm. I'm ready to talk about it. And you know what? That positive response makes me want to say, Opla! Opla! And we want you to be saying Opla as you listen to Opla. Hey everyone, I am here with some very special guests, but before we get to them, first, I want to introduce who's with me here. Uh, I have Ed. Hello. Brodsky. Hey there. And the voice of Flampe, Marianne Bray. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Um, our two big guests here are the, the artists who made the music behind the live action One Piece series. Super excited to talk to both of them. Uh, we have, I'm going to, I hope I don't mispronounce either name since I can't even pronounce things in English super well. Uh, Sonia Belosova. Welcome, Sonia. Yay! So excited to be here. And you got it right. Oh. <laughs> There's a first for everything. Um, we also have Giona Ostinelli. How are you, Giona? Hello. Hello, everybody, and you got it perfectly. Yeah, what are you complaining about? You got it right, 100%. <laughs> there was a name a few weeks ago that I got wrong that was just a completely normal English name, and I couldn't get it right the whole time. So I, I appreciate that. Um, so first of all, I Brodsky and I, before we started, we're just talking about how much we love your music. And Brodsky, I know you are – I haven't seen The Witcher, but I know you have, and you were saying – yeah, because that was the one. I was, uh, cause I, was, I was looking at what other ones you've done, and I saw like Witcher, and I that soundtrack has always had like earworms, and is just a banger. So I was very excited to see that also in like your like discography. Well, see, we we go from toss a coin to your Witcher to toss a berry to your navigator. <laughs> yes. That sounds like a good progression I, to me. Honestly, <laughs> if you wrote that, that'd probably be like the best uh, the best thing to do for like maybe maybe for season two, just like sleek, uh, sneak that in there somewhere. <laughs> We should, we should we should consider <laughs> <laughs> just like a little a little stinger at the end of something um subtle nod <laughs> yeah uh thank you both so much for joining us that you so i i've also want to say all those songs from one piece have been stuck in my head right now even at this moment 
Um, I have Nami's theme stuck in my head. Um, so first I want to ask, how did you get to where you are today? So like, what was the trajectory that got you into composing music for television? Well, we set our sails straight and... <laughs> yeah. and we embarked on this journey. Now, that's actually a great question. Uh, <laughs> we, um, I think when we first started doing this together, that was, wasn't it a David Mamet film? Oh, yeah, it was like right? over 10 years ago. It was over 10 years <laughs> ago. We were pursuing our career separately. At that point, Jonah was scoring a, a lot of films. I was busy with my project with Stan Lee. It was a project called Player Piano, executive produced by Stan Lee of Marvel Comics. Uh, and as part of that project, I was working on big epic virtuosic like piano arrangements of various film TV video game themes. And then we would go and shoot this crazy expensive music videos for that so that was a ton of fun uh and jonah called me up one day we sort of knew each other because you know at that point we were both working here in the industry so like everybody sort of knows everybody uh so he called me up and he had this david mamet film and he was asking uh whether i wanted to do it together with him because the film required a very eclectic score and part of it was very virtuosic piano and i had a break from the stanley project at that point and i was like sure let's try i mean we haven't done anything together at that point but why not i guess it sounds fun and let me tell you this it was so much fun because it's just the two of us being here in the studio coming up with fun crazy stuff together that was such an incredible adventure because we come from such different backgrounds you know i come from a very classical background because i started piano when i was five i started composition when i was 11. at that point i went on to do like every single international competition that was out, out there at that time i won every competition so like I have this very proper classic background while Jonah had a normal background. <laughs> <laughs> more, you know, playing drums, playing a bit of piano in there, coming up playing bands, but more like, you know, the straightforward. The fun background. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> At a certain point, we just realized that when we combine all of that together, we never compete with each other, but we really complement each other really, really well. And plus, we have so many instruments here in the studio because for us, recording is just an integral part of writing and composing. So having the two of us here in the studio, we basically split, you know, who masters which instrument. So it ended up being so much fun from that project that from there on, we just kind of like gradually started being involved in each other's projects. And, and then the mist happened, which was the Stephen King series. Uh, it was the Paramount Network series. And that was such a fantastic experience because we really got to play around within the Stephen King within the Stephen King's universe and like come up with all these interesting, intricate sonorities, uh, a lot of tension, a lot of suspense, a lot of cool instrumentation. I think that was one of the first time we started integrated integrating custom made instruments within our scores because there was that instrument which was kind of like a thunder machine. It was this really weird unique instrument that we had a maker building it and that just brought in so much authenticity and so much of uniqueness into that score and that gave us a lot of ideas so next on i believe was sacred lies which was another tv series produced by blumhouse studios uh rail tucker was an incredible she's an incredible showrunner so she was the showrunner for those series uh so we did sacred lies the first season and the second season and i think that we can say we experimented much more with voice vocals yeah so that was the first series where vocals became an integral component of our writing and that just happened absolutely naturally because um we have young adults who are the main characters of those series. So kind of songs became a natural, organic way to develop that score. But the type of songs that would really be the part of the overall soundtrack, because I personally always hate it when there are songs either in the film or in the series, and they're kind of like needle drops and they have nothing to do within the overall soundscape of the music. So that was the first time where we started integrating vocals so deeply within you know, the soundscape that we were creating on that project. And we had a fantastic time with that. 
Then moving on, there was the Romanovs, which was the Matt Weiner series for Amazon. Yeah. Uh, and that score was so beautiful because very classical. it's very classical. It's very kind of elegant and sophisticated because we never want to repeat ourselves. We, we just don't like that. We love exploring. We love the variety of genres because we ourselves come from such a variety of genres. So we kind of love, we love you know, playing in all these different sandboxes and experimenting with all these different genres. I think, the you know, it's like when you cook for yourself or you go eat, you like enjoy eating the same thing ever, every day. I mean, after a while you want to change. I mean, you can have pizza every day or you can have, you can experiment different cuisines every day. So, right. you know, we're going for that approach. Uh, and as part of the Romanovs, we wrote a mini man mandolin concerto. Uh, which was so much fun and finding that poor mandolin player on a very <laughs> short... so mainly we terrorize mandolin <laughs> yeah we kind of sorry guys but it it came out so much fun and yeah that score it also had a very prominent virtuosic piano component which I love so much because it's just so close to my heart uh, so the Romanovs happened and then I think pretty much right after that the Witcher happened mm -hmm. um and that also happened very naturally because uh, one of our friends, she was the producer on Sacred Lies, Jenny Klein, who ended up being one of the writers and producers on The Witcher. And that's the Jenny Klein who wrote the lyrics for, you know, the toss a coin to your Witcher that hasn't happened at that point yet. He hasn't tossed the coin yet. Yeah, she hasn't tossed the coin yet. Uh, yeah. Uh, she was still holding the coin. So we got involved <laughs> with The Witcher and we love getting involved very, very early on on pretty much any project that we work on because that's when we really get to kind of like put our creativity at work and we love writing music from the script when we're not necessarily tied to any images and because just I, I think you just let the imagination run through it's like when you read uh, a book and you just imagine imagine all the event taking places you can just imagine the cars how you want you just let your imagination run wild and it's fun it's it's a lot of fun see we're, we're all for fun here uh <laughs> and so that's basically how it worked out with the witcher we started writing music way before they even started shooting and actually toss a coin to a witcher was one of the first pieces of music that we wrote for the witcher really? uh and the way that worked yeah because they they haven't even started shooting we had the scripts and we knew there were gonna, gonna be songs and because we were still trying to figure out and narrow down the music approach for the series we wrote i think was it like seven versions for the song uh, it was all sorts of different versions going from, you know, very kind of medieval, classically appropriate to something in between, to something even music theater-ish, to all the way contemporary. We even had a rap version that oh. I had to record as a demo. So imagine me trying to do a rap version of that. That was fun. I like and the reason why these hidden other versions that are out there. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Totally. And, you know the reason why is like because you're trying to figure out the tone of the show musically, and you know the more versions, the more styles you try, the more you can see like oh this works really cool. This maybe it should be a combination of these styles and this other style. So so then when we wrote that version, everybody settled on the version of Toss a Coin to Your Witcher, which then changed very min minimal minimally. Yeah, and from when we wrote it to the final version of the song, it's yeah, it stayed very very close to how we wrote it to the initial voice and piano sketch because it was always envisioned that jazz care is that type of you know we like calling him the freddie mercury of that continent because like he's about to become like that rock star of the continent so he needed the hit song the anthem song because up until that point he was just a bard singing in a tavern not much special about him but he needed that hit song so that's why toss a coin to your witcher had to be that anthemic type of song so then Toss a Coin to Your Witcher happened and, you know, suddenly we wake up and we're number one on Billboard, not just on the soundtrack charts, but on the rock charts, which was like, wow, wait a second. And that was the summer when Panic at the Disco released their song, High Hopes, which I love that song. Gotta go have high, high hopes, we're living. So those guys were number two and we were number one. And we were like, what's going on here? You're like, you beat, you beat Panic of the Disco. <laughs> We were panicking, uh, but, <laughs> but not at the disco, yeah. just here at the studio, That's kind great. of like screaming. Panic at the studio. <laughs> Panic at the studio, exactly. Uh, that was crazy. I think right now the album has surpassed half a billion album streams, which for a soundtrack album is just something mm -hmm. out of this world. And that's completely crazy. So The Witcher happened. 
then after The Witcher, the thing about Pam happened, which uh, Jenny Klein, our lovely dear Jenny Klein, who wrote the lyrics for Toss a Coin to a Witcher, she became the showrunner for The Thing About Pam. And we got to write the music for those incredible series starring Renée Zellweger. Uh, that was an incredible ride because we got to experiment so much here in the studio with so many different instruments, not just instruments, with slurps, because our character in the series, she drinks a big gulp. And we, we were looking for that kind of like disgusting slurping sound. And Jonah started slurping. We were just trying because we were trying to incorporate that sound in the, in the, in the score, you know, early ideas. And then we record it, we modify it a little bit, and then we send it. And everybody's like, oh, this is really cool. And then at a certain point, we receive a call, uh, an email from sound effects, like the sound design people are like, hey, can we have the slurping sound? And we're like, uh, yes, why? It's like, oh, because we want to put it in when Renee slurps. I'm like, wait, it's not going to be <laughs> Renee slurping? We always assume, you know, we do it as a temp and then we substitute with her slurping. Kind of became the other way around. So it's, it's, it's Jonah slurping. <laughs> Jonah. We call John the slurp master. Yeah, exactly. We have all sorts of slurps in that score. Short slurps, long, like prolonged, disgusting slurps. Uh, yeah, all sorts of creativity happened there. Um, so that was the thing about Pam. And pretty much as soon as we were done with Pam, uh, One Piece happened. And the way that happened is that John and I are huge fans of One Piece. And after we were done with The Witcher, we were looking for the next project for us, the type of project that would require very unique and elaborate world building, because we love building these music worlds. We love, you know, when the, a project is not necessarily tied to a specific geographical location, but when there are no boundaries and constraints to, you know, to create that music world building entirely from the ground up. And as soon as we learned about Netflix making world of uh, world peace, <laughs> one piece. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> kind of thing. So as soon as we learned about Netflix uh, working on the project, we immediately knew that we really wanted to be involved. Yeah. Um, and the way that worked is we got creative as we usually do in the studio. Uh, and we shot a video. And that was a basically a three minute video in which we completely outlined the full concept about the music universe of One Piece that we would create and all the different instrumentations and themes that we would assign to every single one of our straw heads and how all those themes and instrumentation would get glued within Luffy's theme because Luffy's our captain and he's the glue of our crew, right? And then at the end of that video, because we showcased all the different instruments, and then at the end of the video, we played that theme. Uh, that was a year and a half ago. That was exactly the concept of the whole soundtrack. And that was that theme that became the main theme of our show. Uh, and that's kind of how one thing's happened. Mm -hmm. So that, I guess that's a long answer. <laughs> a good one. No, that's perfect. The, the less we have to do. <laughs> no, that's... That's really cool. So I so I'm curious to take a step back. Um, when did you first discover One Piece, and was there always a musical connection with it? I mean, One Piece. I mean, it came out when was it? Ninety seven. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think in Europe arrived in either ninety nine or two thousand one. So it was one of those uh, anime that was, you know people will be watching it together with like either Dragon, Dragon Ball. It's it's one of those. So, so it was hard not to know about it, right? Correct. I think for me, I discovered it later on. But as soon as I started watching the anime, I was like, oh my goodness, this is so much fun. Because like, where yeah. do you get to watch a character like kicking someone's butt for like 20 episodes in a row? It's so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, but also to me, it's, I always like enjoy uh, One Piece very much. Like I... I I never really got into Dragon Ball, for example, that much because it was, um, I don't know, I never really got into it, but with One Piece, it's just the whole story and the whole, uh, you know, the crew coming together. I, I well, like it very much. It has a lot of fun, but it also has a lot of heart and emotion. Correct. And I think that's what draws you in. Correct. Yeah. I mean, we've touched the tip of the iceberg even in the live action with that, I feel like. Um, that That's crazy because also in the United States, at least, it never really hit that. And then all of a sudden, here we are in 2023, and it's just exploded. And it's um, it's just amazing to see. And I think, 
I mean, I, I know at least I think Brodsky and I talked about it too. Just like the idea of seeing this, like I w- watching it and watching it at the end with that beautiful song that you, that uh, Aurora right uh, sung on. I'm like, wow, this is a real show. This is like a, I know that's a weird way to put it, but like this is like a cinematic experience I'm watching, and it's the show I've been, I've been invested in for like. 18, 19 years or whatever it is, um, is just crazy. I don't want to monopolize the conversation if, no, if you say, all have no, I'll, 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 I'll say too, like I'll say, watching it with a, a buddy of mine who's he's getting into One Piece on his own without me even pushing it on him. So he let me like uh, binge it with him. And at that ending scene when like the song was hitting, I was like, why am I, why am I crying? <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, you're meant I a few to be times. crying. Yeah. I like take a pause for I a second, was, but yeah. it was like, again, like it, the music was so perfect in that moment too. Cause it just like fled through like all the emotions you had, like watching it and just felt like that, like perfect kind of like combination at the end there. Too kind, but look, it's like also for us first time when we first received, started receiving the images, we we're like, Oh my gosh, this is so cool because it's so, it follows the manga so well. And it's like, as far fa- as fans were like, this is so closely done with like it's so close to it that it just it just brings back so many memories and it's well you know what not even kidding you like every single time i would sit down with the whole team to spot either an episode or a scene like to spot meaning that we would sit down and discuss it and discuss like what the music would do how it would function function in a specific scene every single time they would send us a new scene and then we would go and discuss it we would be like oh my goodness guys this is so cool like the first time we saw the very ending sequence when they're there with the barrel and about to set sails for the grand line i remember talking with the team about it and we were like this is so great this is really cool this is so exciting this is just such a perfect ending for this for this season and it's so cool because it's like it's it's like in the manga and you like it's not different you're like oh my gosh this is exactly how you know, when reading it, I was imagining it. Because and... I feel like with properties like that, it's so easy to deviate and you have to deviate. Like there isn't yeah. like just a show like that or film, whatever, a project like that has to has its has to have its own identity. So you will have to deviate no matter what. But there are so many elements about the manga that are so iconic and so dear to the whole fan base that it's very important to have those elements incorporated and the elements that made manga so popular have them translate into the live action and i think that's what the team did so well uh yeah, yeah. and that's, keeping the integrity of the original manga and also that's why also we thought it was important to have a song for the dramatic arc of the season because mm. we always thought we always had the feeling that you know is the first season it's yes it's the season where luffy fi- finds the going mary and his crew but you know emotionally it's really nami's story like her because... backstory and everything right so we need to have a song that uh, emotionally represent her journey because the whole season is really like we're going at the speed of 200 for pretty much the whole yeah. season yeah. like more 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 bigger 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 like you know, there's so much happening on screen, uh, musically, that really the only moments that we can kind of take a step back and breathe and really dive into the emotional parts of the show is these are the moments connected with Nami's story. And that's really, as you said, John, and that's an emotional arc of the season. So as soon as we started working on Nami's theme, we knew that we needed a song for Nami. And while, for example, with Toss a Coin to Your Witcher, uh, what happened there is we introduced the theme of the song at the beginning of the episode, then we develop it throughout the episode, and then the full song happens at the very, very end of the episode. Here we had such a fantastic opportunity to introduce Nami's theme. As soon as we meet Nami in episode one, then we develop this theme throughout the whole season. This way the audience really gets to dive into it and experience all the different shapes and forms of this theme. And then at the end of the season, in episode eight, we arrive towards its most powerful and lyrical song rendition performed by Aurora. And this way, you've never heard it as a song yet, but at the same time, you've been hearing that theme throughout the whole season. So yes, it's very new, but at the same time, it's something very kind of familiar at that point. So then when you hear the song coming in in episode eight, it's like, oh, I've been waiting for this all along. And like, this is finally the emotional reveal and emotional moment. Because also, it's also 
the emotional reveal and moment in the show for Nami. That's Correct. when we finally find out why she, you know, why she was doing all the things that she was doing. Correct. Right. Without spoiling the show for anyone who hasn't seen it yet, I, I adore the. Fact I don't know why they'd be listening to us, but go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but like I was saying, like I, I adore that thought process of like just having it sprinkled through and like kind of like blending it in and out, and then just having it all come together. Like that is, that is such a fun thing. I that, have to like, rewatch I, it. Yeah, I was gonna to, say like I'm gonna yeah. rewatch it and like listen for all those like little bits and see. Like for example, it appears as soon as we meet Nami, right? So there is the mm -hmm. scene in episode one where Nami supposedly is stranded at sea, right? And the pirates come in, and then she pirates the pirates, right? Uh, so the song, the theme of my sails, it sounds slow in episode eight. It's the dry map of the world of lands unknown and untold, right? In episode one. It's a fun, kind of upbeat, quirky version of this theme. It's performed by a flute, and you get da dum ba da 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 da, da dum ba da 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 da, da dum ba da 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 da, da 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 So it's exactly the same theme, just much faster, much more upbeat. Yeah, and I think the first time where you get the, where we uh, play the theme in the emotional way, kind of like in the song, is actually in episode three when she's talking to Kaya. And there is the little interaction where uh, Kaya talks briefly about her parents, how they uh, died, and, and then Nami also kind of opens up. And we have a very, you know, in that whole six minutes montage where we keep going between uh, Nami and Kaya and then Usap, Luffy, and Zoro. You know, it's full of music, uh, heavy instrumentation, but then in that moment, it's just solo piano, very intimate. And if you listen carefully, it excels. It's that, that, that theme. The theme. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's the first time it we show showcase it in that lyrical, emotional version. Correct. Yeah. Because it's also the first time Nami is about to open up mm -hmm. about her story. And so, like, that's appropriate. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's, cool. I'm actually very excited to watch it again. Yeah, I, I, I really, I like that theme. I've, heard it a million times i don't know why i didn't put two and two together there i think also when you're watching the series for the first time there's so many things as you said it's going 200 miles an hour um i have to take it slow and 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 rewatch that a few more i'm, I'm sure i will be rewatching that a few right, more i've times. already done oh, it yeah. three times because i'm in fact <laughs> wow in fact we're not just doing this with nami but we're doing that same right. trick with every single character because with so many things happening you know, in the series, there are so many characters. It's a character-driven piece. We have five main characters. Then we have all the villains, and all of them are such amazing and powerful villains. There is There are a lot of characters. There is a lot happening in the show. There is a lot of music in the show because every episode is pretty much wall-to-wall. -wall. So the only way to make something like this cohesive and structured is by creating solid themes uh, to develop throughout the whole season. And for example, the scene that Jonah referenced uh, in episode three, uh, where Nami's theme first happens in a lyrical way, that's that's kind of like a great way to to take a look at all those themes and instrumentations that we have going on within, within the season, because we have Nami uh, and Kaya, and first there is a dialogue between them two. Nami is represented by a flute, Kaya is represented by an oboe. So as they're talking on screen, there is the same dialogue happening musically between Nami's flute and Kaya's oboe. Then we switch to Usopp and Luffy. Usopp is represented by an ukulele. And in fact, it's a bluesy ukulele because Usopp is so quirky. He's kind of shy, insecure, secure, very small. So we needed that <laughs> small quirky instrument for him. Here comes ukulele as he's going to grow further on in the seasons, because his dream is to become the bravest pirate, right? His instrument is also going to grow in size. So for now, we're, is, we're with ukulele, but mm. eventually, hopefully, we're going to get to something much bigger, maybe like a 12 strings guitar, because it's so big, right? So I was going to say, I, I hope to see Usopp running around with a ukulele at one of these points, but I guess... <laughs> I guess we should be asking for like a double bass at this point. No, or I something want... really huge. No, Zach, I kept thinking about think the, the, the like Soga King theme at that point. Yeah, yeah. with a little so we have, the ukulele. 
we have Usopp with his ukulele and then Luffy's instrument is a hurdy-gurdy. So just as those two are talking on screen, there is ukulele talking with a hurdy-gurdy musically, right? Then we switch back to Nami and Kaya and their flutes and oboes come back in with that lyrical moment uh, where we feature nice Nami's theme. And then back and forth. So like, as there is that back and forth happening on screen, there is exactly the same exact back and forth happening musically. And this way there is storytelling happening, not just on screen, but also musically. And we have this going on throughout the whole season. Yeah, especially it's a great way to structure a score because especially when you have so many action sequences throughout the season, especially is that, you know, there are very long action sequences it's a great way to keep the action systems in dynamics because then you can be like, oh, let's switch to Sanji's theme. Let's switch to the Fishman's theme. Let's switch to Zoro's theme now. Let's switch to Luffy's theme. And you can keep it very going and you never run out of idea of material because you have so much. So because many you themes. have a plan. Yeah, you have a plan. Can I, I, I had not known of... what a hurdy-gurdy was until just now. And oh, yeah. did you not? No, I was going to say, like... It's perfect for Lucy. Say, it's amazing. It I know, it's perfect It is for the him. most chaotic instrument I have ever seen, and, like, and I... And Luffy is... Uh... And so, like, when you said hurdy-gurdy for Luffy, I, that's why, I, like, I reacted, because I was just like, that is... I could not think of a perfect, more perfect instrument to represent Luffy. Once you actually play a rubber band or something, that's oh. the only other... Right. <laughs> oh, well... <laughs> I'm not it's suggesting like a, that. Well, <laughs> no, we have, we have, uh, we have in this in, buried in a couple of scenes like a jaw harp, but it was with mm. Luffy. But yeah, yeah. rubber hand, it's a great idea, actually. That boy yeah. yeah. <laughs> sound. I love Hurdy Gurdy because it's, it's such a funky instrument. Like, it's, never in tune it's always out of tune but it's such a versatile instrument and you can actually do so much and obviously it's such an iconic like musical jolly roger when we were talking about anything pirates related but like by being so out of tune you know you can do some bends you can do some cool things you can put an amplifier and it might even sound like an electric guitar or like a squeak screaming cat or like a screaming cat <laughs> speaking of uh for kuro that's exactly <laughs> we're doing because for Kuro it's a combination of shrieking dulcimers and hurdy-gurdies kind of doing like type of thing and I'm not even kidding you the first time I remember we that it, yeah yeah they were like do you guys have a cat in the studio like do you, do you guys have a cat? we're in like no hurdy-gurdy uh we have that for Kuro and we also recorded the sound of the knives being sharpened because oh, yeah. Kuro is such an iconic part of his look or his claws so we were like, well, how can we recreate that musically? Well, quite literally, let's bring in knives in the studio. Uh, full disclaimer, no composers were hurt in that process <laughs> and no microphones were cut. <laughs> That's good. Those those things are expensive. <laughs> yes. Mary uh, yeah. So speaking of themes, um, us anime fans, of course, noticed that you managed to slip in a few notes of We Are and, of course, Binks Brew. Um, What's yeah. the, like, is there, like, a legal process for making that work? Because uh, I was very curious. Like, obviously, it's not the whole theme for We Are, but it is a good chunk of it. But for Binks Brew, it is. Um, so, like, what's, how does that, how does that work? Like, how are you allowed to use that? It, it's a fairly complicated. Fairly, I, I would say fairly doesn't even begin describing it. it like, is very... <laughs> I could imagine. We had, we had uh, alternative options in case we couldn't get the license because it you know it's a process that took over over a year and you know even when we finished recording it was not still uh mm -hmm. clear if it could have been used or not so we had to mm -hmm. record alternative versions without it in case we could not use it so like for fans asking why like more songs couldn't have been incorporated well for several reasons first of them is the legal reason because it is indeed a very tricky and complicated process to get licenses for those songs but then uh the second thing is that it was of paramount importance to to all of us to you know john and i to Matt and Steve, our showrunners, to Tomorrow Studios, to Netflix, and obviously to Oda himself, that the One Piece live action would have its own identity and its own musical identity. With that said, we all acknowledge that over the years, there are certain songs from the anime series that have become truly iconic, and we just couldn't mm -hmm. ignore that fact. And those songs are so much fun, so we had to find a way to bring some of those in, 
again, given the licensing com complexities. Yeah, because it's also, you know, with the licensing, there is also a certain amount that you can use. You're limited by how much of the song you can use. You're limited by how much you can use, and also you're limited to what kind of usage you can do, like where exactly in the show it can be used. Yeah, and, and that's also like, and also on top of that, you know, you cannot just take it and drop it in the show because it's not going to belong there because the rest yeah. of the show, you know, doesn't have the sonority. In so fact, like, for example, uh, in episode four, where we, the first time we introduced We Are, uh, the very first version that we wrote actually uh, had a longer version of what We Are, and it was closer to, in the spirit to how We Are sounds originally. It had kind of like those funky, jazzy harmonies, but... It, you know, it, that version got rejected and for all the right reasons, because it was too standalone and it didn't feel like it belonged to the universe of One Piece live action. It's like, in a way, it's like, okay, it's going to be a very weird analogy, but I'm curious, stay with I'm curious. me. Oh, in a way, go. it's like doing like an organ transplant. You know, you take from another person, you put in a new body and the body has to accept it. Uh Kind of the same way, like you take... I mean, uh, it is weird, but it kind of works. It works because you take something that belongs to something else and you bring <laughs> well, to someone else. To case. someone else, well, to it, a different... Right. In your analogy. Generally. Yeah, but you bring it in and the show has to, you know, it has to work. So we spend quite a bit of time on how to make We Are work sonor like sound-wise to make it fit with the rest of the show. And that's why, you know, the placements of We Are they're also very significant because the first time it appears in episode four, where our Straw Hats crew, now they finally got Going Mary and they're embarking on their first voyage on the Going Mary. Uh, and this time it's very cheerful, happy, it's exciting, right? And it's intercut with our character themes. So we start with We Are, then we cut to Nami, and that's where we play Nami's theme. Then we cut to Zoro, and we have Zoro's theme, then cut to Usopp and have Usopp's theme. And then we end with We Are, we're kind of creating an arc to this sequence. And then We Are happens again at the very end of the show. Uh, and this time around, yes, it sounds adventurous because they're about to embark on the adventure towards the Grand Line. But at the same time, it's kind of like dangerous and treacherous because it's a pretty dangerous adventure ahead. So it also kind of like sounds like a warning. So a very different type of adventure. Yeah, it's not that simple to cross, to enter the Grand Line. So. No, it is really not no. that simple. Or so, don't and, be in it. <laughs> right. You know, and... And with Bing's Brew, kind of the same thing. It was like we wanted to feature it as, uh, like in a in one of those, uh, not tavern, but well, yeah, one tavern. of those yeah. taverns, kind of, because even though Brooks as a character he doesn't appear further on, like we kind of needed we uh, sorry we are Bing's Brew like earlier because because it's being brew come on so it yeah. made sense to um, actually have it associated with shanks and that's why the first time we encounter is you know when there is a flashback to shanks uh there was actually another moment where we briefly use bing's brew but again going back to the licenses it was just a bit too complicated to use it in that mm -hmm. other moment so we had to like scrap the idea but i'm glad that we featured it in that sequence because we actually like get to hear it properly and there yeah. is enough yeah. room for yeah. it to develop so i thought it was really fun. Was, and it was very fun sorry i was saying i was very fun that because everybody wanted to make it sound like you know you're in this uh tavern where like the performer is a bit drunk and he's not perfectly in tune <laughs> so recording that it was fun <laughs> So I'm curious too in relation to that because I, I he said I I do uh, English dubs for things I'm a voice actor um and I've sung uh, Binks's Brew as part of the English dub for One Piece and I'm curious if uh I mean obviously I'm sure it's gonna be you're gonna try to utilize it later on hopefully uh if if the lyrics would be the same or if you would have to do your own translation for that ooh. ooh. As what we have like in our in the anime, like everything's English an adaptation. Yeah, I'll say that's that true. The anime is different from the manga, and the manga translation yeah. is different than the original. And yeah, everything's an adaptation. I'm yeah. answering for you. I don't know why. <laughs> that's how you get those like the like that ble uh, that blur that little legal line. <laughs> you can change yeah. it, right? Question. You just uh, change a note. 
Yeah, I, I wouldn't really know how to answer it at this stage because, like, we would need to get there. Right. Yeah. Far away. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. This season, there was no conversations about using lyrics, and that actually might be an additional hurdle legally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, once we get there, if we get there, and if there would be another usage of Bing's Brew anywhere further down the road, I guess we'll cross that bridge then. But I'm not sure, actually. I mean, okay, I, I cannot speak for everybody. I'm not sure we would be using it with the lyrics, though, because, like, again, going back to the show, the live action having its own distinct identity, if we were to bring in the lyrics, I mean, it's just something that ties it to anime immediately. Sure. So whether it's something that we want to do or not, we'll need to see. It would have to be very specific, very special circumstances to, to make that work. Yeah. It's 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 a hard thing to imagine too because all of us are one piece fans and you have to think of it yeah. also from the point of view of someone who has no experience with it correct i'll say too yeah, when I was, and what uh, would they think of it yeah like, go ahead sorry uh, like when i when i was watching with my friend who has never heard bing's brew before because he's not he's only 100 episodes and he's not you know when <laughs> when that shows up in thriller and uh yeah. in thriller bark i was so 400 excited 400 chapters later and i was just like yelling and i was like hitting him and he's like, no idea what i was talking about <laughs> so i think from like as as like you know fans if we heard that like even if that's all we ever get like the legal like they yeah. they block it out you know that's enough for me the fact that it was like a small like little easter egg i'd be i was cheering yeah when i heard that yeah. and the we are shocked me i guess we're spoiling it if someone for some reason doesn't but um no, that that was that was like oh, like whoa! This is One Piece. We're watching One Piece right now. Yeah. Uh, as as it's long time like, fans, it would be like you know watching a James Bond movie without the iconic James yeah. Bond. Exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. like you, you, you need a little. Have, <laughs> and you need a little. It doesn't need to be overpowering, but having a little bit, just as like Easter eggs here and there, it's it's very heartwarming. Yeah. I'll I'll admit too, uh, I didn't yeah. catch We Are until the end too, because I think I was just taking in everything and then when i was like listening to it and oh, i just come on heard, when they're going merry well yeah but like when you just like hear it kind of silently the fact that you guys did change it so much that you just kind of like hear it silently come in and when i realized what it was again like the emotions that it evoked i think was so much better that you guys turned it into kind of your own thing than just you know what what we're all you know used to hearing for we are I mean, that's also a good example of something that like, so us as fans know the emotional toll of the Mary. And I think they did a good job telegraphing that in the show too. And I think having We Are There in the background also brings up extra emotions, which is probably why you hit your friend, Bronski. <laughs> All the time. He's used to it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I get um, I, I, go ahead. Oh no, I said, I just get very excited. Uh, I know. Um, I, so I was going to ask um, a couple of hypothetical questions. Um, mm -hmm. First, so I know you used a lot of, I've, I've watched your videos on, first of all, the the themes for Mihawk in particular strike me in the heart. I love it. I'm a huge flamenco fan. So it was really great to see. Um, and, and, and Zorro, you know, everyone, but for characters that have not yet been introduced, are there any that like stand out to you that need like a very specific different instrument? Every character needs a specific pretty much instrument. On this yeah, show, I guess that's a... every character, like any. Should we know... be naming instruments and trying to figure out which character? <laughs> no, I just want to like, listen even, like, you know, even like yeah. uh, in this season, like take someone like uh, Nazumi. That he only appears very briefly at the end, but we have his theme. Like each marine has, you know, their like their theme is based on the marine sound. But then for each of the marine, it takes a different uh, shape depending on their personality. You know, Garp is different from Ax Morgan, obviously, which is different from. Nazumi. Yeah, so like nothing musically in this show is accidental. Correct. Everything right. has been carefully pre-planned, like with Nizumi, for example, since you talked about him, like his theme is a version of the Marine theme. So there are those snares, military drums and trumpets, which are like the signature elements of the Marine theme. But he also has kind of like mousy strings doing like <laughs> -da 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 -pom 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 -pom. so like there is a mousy comical aspect, I guess, to his theme. To make how sketchy, I mean, it's sneaky, like... like... Yeah, like it's, it's very kind of 
contemporary classical, if I may say that. But I remember when we sent it to the team first, because it's just, it's so particular and so weird in a beautiful classical way. Uh, when we sent it to the team, we were like, well, there's no way they're going to approve that. I mean, it's just too specific. And they loved it. And we were like, hell yeah. Yeah. We love that scene. Like, I personally cannot wait for when Django is going to appear. Like, I know <laughs> I in hope the... he does. Yeah. Please, right. So I, I really hope because I really like him as a character and I think it would be yeah. so much fun. So, you know, bizarre and everything. So, yeah. He's a so, he's a favorite amongst the crew here, to our crew here too. Um <laughs> Yes. And on Mirabal Island. Shame. And Mirabal yeah. Island. We just need maybe just we need a Netflix needs to make a special just a Django that. special. <laughs> yes. Yeah, like, like you could do your disco flex your disco muscles. <laughs> well, I'm curious uh, to develop Alvita's theme because we only get Alvita just a little bit in this season, yeah. and we have a harpsichord because it's Alvita, so we needed something yeah. classy but aggressive. Classy and aggressive, exactly, because like on harpsichord, you're always getting the same dynamic, so it's always right in your face, but at the same time, it's very elegant. So I would be curious to develop her theme, and also because the actress who plays Alvita, something that we found out as we were working on the show, she's actually a phenomenal singer. And Ooh. we saw some of her videos on Instagram, and she is absolutely fantastic. So we're pitching to the team to have Alvida sing. Uh, I don't know whether that's something that we're actually going to implement, but she's just such a great singer, and yeah, that would be fun. I think she's stand out, um, yeah, in the in the in the show too. There's not enough Alvida. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, a theme that will be developed quite a bit uh, if there is a second season. It's obviously Smoker. Oh, Smoker, mm. oh, yeah. yes. Yes, we get a little bit of the glimpse of his theme at the very, very end. And it kind of has a Mozart Don Giovanni vibe to, to it. I wouldn't even explain why, but it's that it kind just of... Came out that it way. just came out that way. It was that... Uh, because he's a Marine, so there had to be something classy about his and theme. Military. But at the same time, military and incredibly powerful. So I guess that's kind of where we came up with the Don Giovanni reference. Uh, but that's the theme that we're very excited to develop further on. Or, for example, the Baroque works, because we only get a little glimpse of it in this season where Zoro is fighting Mr. Seven. And when Mr. Seven shows him the card, Baroque works, there is that motif of, it's kind of like double basses and a couple of other elements together. So that's the motif for Baroque works oh, wow. that we also get to... There was another moment, right, in this season where uh, where was it? I forget. I'm forgetting. I yeah, I don't remember where, but there was another. Moment. There was another moment in this season where we briefly kind of re have this motif reappear, but further on, we're excited to. There's also it. one multi. I mean, a theme that we uh, use here, like the music that it's the music that it's used in that specific moment is specific. It's not just random, like. Which well, moment are you talking about? For Shandora, the city of gold. Yes. Shandora, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. So that music, it's, you know, if we ever going to get to Shandora. <laughs> so there is there is a lot. There are a lot of Easter eggs musically, like within the live action universe. And nothing is ever accidental, but everything has been pre-planned. So yeah. we're excited to develop those motifs. Oh, yeah. at, at 200 now, miles an hour, you'll get there yeah. pretty quick. I think <laughs> even. See, now I'm wondering if 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 uh, for Tashigi will have sort of a marine version of Kuina mm. since they are so similar. Oh, yeah. Oh, I miss Tashigi. I'm so we don't get to see her yet. Hopefully. Yeah, soon. <laughs> well, When there's smoker, there'll be soon. Tashigi. Soon chronologically. When there's smoke, there's fire. When there's smoker, there's Tashigi. When there's yep. smoker, there's Tashigi. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Was there, I, so I also saw that you played, I think before the series came out, you played a lot of the, uh, by ear, I think, like a lot of the major themes of One Piece, uh, Sonia. Um, is there any theme, song, uh, whatever from One Piece that for whatever reason, probably legal, that you really wanted to get it in, but it just wasn't happening or that you really hope to get in in the future? Oh. One I really hope to do is run, run, run. I mean, run, run, run is fun. I don't uh, know. That to me is just every time I hear it, I, re I just associate, associate it with the images of the yeah. anime. And I love that. Like, yeah, of course, beautiful. you know, fans, like my whole Instagram right now is going overtaken, overtaken, overtaken. 
and <sighs> like again going back to legal things it's it's tricky uh so we can use overtaking but we do have a couple of places within the season and one person guessed where one person person actually i think i noticed where but i'm not gonna even (laughs) we have a couple of places where it's 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 not exactly so like if you're looking for exactly the motif of overtaking you're not gonna find that but there are places where it's a gentle nod to overtake and so we have two places within the season yeah. but like overall again like i cannot stress enough that as much as we all love the score for anime this is live action so it has to have its own identity and this is actually one of was one of the number one priorities for oda to make sure that yeah. the live action version has its own identity including its unique music identity well especially because it's based on the manga and not on the anime correct so correct they wanted to make it you know we're not adapting the anime we're adapting the manga like, so. mm-hmm. because also there are things that uh, in the live action there are uh they are represented like in the manga but not like in the anime and it's like well yeah because it's based on the manga not on the anime correct so for <laughs> all of us the manga is the main source of our inspiration the bible yeah the, the bible the <laughs> yeah. anime it's something that is just so sweet and dear to all of us but the manga is the bible well, i guess like, that's something you can yeah. think about is that in the like anime we always have like those the same type of themes that are kind of heard but like with live action you actually get to play and have music going consistently through the entire show whereas like we don't get that in the anime you don't get that while you're reading so it's it's very or it repeats the literally the same track. Yeah. Well, it's a yeah. thousand something episodes. What are you gonna do? But... You know, it's also fun that you're pointing out to that because that was another directive from Oda because he wanted to have the music of the live action very cinematic, very big, very full. Uh, and we love the music from the anime, but it is a lot of those needle drops throughout it, and also. That's why they're so memorable because you just keep hearing them consistently and it's so much fun but it's a very different medium and here for Oda the main priority was to have the music as cinematic and as big and grandiose as it can possibly get yeah. Um, should we ask our usual questions I think that we ask everyone about One Piece Um, uh, Marianne Brodsky Ed do you have any other questions before I uh, I guess no, I'm, I'm... I'm curious. Well, go ahead, Ratsky. Go ahead. Go ahead, ahead Ratsky. I guess, like, one question is, um, because you're you're saying every character had a, uh, an instrument. I was just curious about like Buggy and Mihawk, (laughs) what their instruments are. I just I I gotta know because I love. I I liked how you described it before we started, Brodsky. Brodsky, that Buggy's theme. I think you said hits way too hard. It goes like it's it's too good for Buggy. Is maybe (laughs) the problem. Is that Buggy <laughs> doesn't deserve that much love, but it, it's it's oh, it's great. Not. Yeah, I think oh, some of the fans Buggy, are just Buggy deserves all the love. <laughs> I know I'm getting yelled at by people on our own on our own crew. I hear it right now through the headphones. But yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So, Buggy's theme. Um, we love Buggy, and Buggy is the perfect representation of both, you know, a powerful villain, but also an unhinged clown. So we needed a theme which is so huge and over the top and powerful, but at the same time has a circus vibe. So that's how Buggy's scene came together. And because his powers are chop-chop powers, so the idea was how can we incorporate that chop-chop into the music? And the answer was literally. So the way that happened is we literally recorded chop, 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 chop. Jonah, you can demonstrate. Chop, 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 chop. We did, yeah. We did like very, very fast because when you hear a buggy theme, there is always a fast-paced riff to it. Like, da 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 dum da 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 Right? So that da 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 if you listen closely, it's actually chop, 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 uh, courtesy of Jonah, who layered a lot of vocals and a lot of different stacks and like different sonorities. It was a long one. <laughs> it was a long time of chop chop, of chopping. But that became one of the signature elements for Buggy. So, literally, whenever we have Buggies on screen, uh, on screen, what am I talking well, about? Well, that's about right. Um, <laughs> and his theme is playing. There is always that chop chop. Also, even when he's not on screen, on screen uh for example, <laughs> we are about to see him in episode two and we see his ship but we don't see buggy yet the music is already telling you that buggy has arrived and you see in the music you hear in the music you hear in there it's sunday guys i'm sorry <laughs> right 
and then also he has also the more the more circus music like na 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 so fun fact um that piece of music is written in c sharp minor which on its own like okay c sharp minor just a regular key well c sharp minor is probably the most complicated key for the strings to play because there are so many sharps in that key. And I know I'm getting very technical, but it's really funny because there are so many sharps in that key. For poor strings players, it's so hard to get it in tune, which ended up being really perfect for Buggy because it's that out of tune circus. So his music and his sound is pretty much out of tune slightly. It's that like there is something slightly off. So that key ended up being perfect. Well, because we kept the musicians like uh, on, on edge on edge and it's like well it's kind of like buggy so it makes sense yeah, yeah. It's fitting. <laughs> it's just say, he tortured you as well as the yeah as we were torturing in the poor string player yeah, so, but yeah. they had fun they they really enjoyed it yeah everyone and was for... tortured and loved it <laughs> <laughs> this you know that was pretty much how our sessions went because we were recording from february until june we were here in la the orchestra was the slovak national symphony in bratislava uh, so it was overnight. It was like four or five days overnight every single month. Uh, and we would record from like here will be like midnight or 1 a.m. until 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. So, you know, night, 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 night. Yeah, night. We, we will get jet lag after a few days. Like you get jet lag without leaving LA. And it's like, oh. So it was kind of torturous here, but then also for musicians because there's so much music. And the music is very complex and very virtuosic because, again, we're at like 200% pretty much the whole time. This is just like the dynamics of the show. So they have to be, they had to be like digging in at all times. And yes, it was physically very challenging for them, but they had so much fun. It was such a fun session. Like every session was a fun session. So Mihawk, switching back to that. Um, as soon as we saw Mihawk and as soon as we saw Steven, Steven Ward, who, who is the actor who plays Mihawk, as soon as we saw him on screen, he's so phenomenal. He's fantastic. We just fell in love with him immediately. He's my per favorite character. Like every time. Me yeah. too. Like, <laughs> yeah. He, he's top. Uh, and as soon as we saw him on screen, we knew we had to do something special for him. Uh, and Mihawk being the best, the world's greatest swordsman, uh, you know, having the abilities to be so precise, so virtuosic with his sword technique, we had to find the artist who would be the world's greatest artist, you know, within his instrument and who would have that same precision and ultimate technique that Mihawk possesses. And the artist was Marcian. As soon as we saw Mihawk, we knew immediately we had to bring in Marcian. And we worked with Marcin before on our album, our Sony album, because us and Marcin were all Sony artists. So we knew him from before. And he is just, as soon as he grabs his guitar and the way he plays, his playing style, it's kind of like orchestra within one guitar. Like he strikes a chord and the whole room goes on fire. This is just how he plays. Uh, we knew we had to bring him in. So we were very lucky to bring him on board. And he was so excited because he's also a fan of One Piece. And he was like, Mihawk, guitar, yes, let's do it. And he had so many ideas. Um, like we would literally, like he was mainly in Poland, but then at a certain point he came here to our studio. Uh, so we were just juggling ideas back and forth. And, and I, I think, you know, the <clears throat> beauty with Mihawk, the way he, you know, his dress, everything about him it's so to us was screaming so much like flamenco and just that yeah. you know but more than that more than that but you know it extra was so much flamenco. extra exactly. flamenco and <laughs> you know everybody was encouraging that you know matt steve netflix they were all on board on making it over the top flamenco and i think that was so good and that's why for example like trying to record it with a regular flamenco artist probably wouldn't have worked because we needed that over the top over the top quality and marcin just has it so much and he radiates that incredible virtuosic over the top quality so we were so lucky to have him on board so we were just juggling ideas the whole time like what about this how about this like how would you perform that or like do your magic here and that's kind of how it happened and then the end credits track of episode five uh where we have this incredible action sequence between zoro and mihawk so we're like after at the end of this epic action sequence we just needed 
a special track, a very special track featuring Marcin. So we pretty much had the track ready. Uh, we were about to record it. It was already orchestrated. Like in three days, we were having a recording session. He was here in our studio. It was like midnight or 1 a.m. He was about to leave. And he's like, guys, let me grab my guitar. I actually have an idea. So he sits down here and he's like, what if like we change this part and make it like this? And we're like, oh, there is something in that. Let's Let's look at it. So 1 a.m. in the morning, two days before the recording session, the music is orchestrated. We changed half of the track. And <laughs> the next morning we had to call our orchestrator being like, oops. The music has changed. The music has changed. But I'm so glad we came up with that because the track was very good before. But, you know, with those ideas that he came up with at 1 a.m. in the morning, two days before the recording session, that track from good became really freaking cool. And we all got so excited. And then as soon as we recorded the track, we knew we were like, that, that's it. Like, this is me, Hawk. And the best part was, you know, we were doing it, you know, went late, obviously. And, you know, we started messing around around 1 a.m. And then after a few hours, Marcin was like, yeah, maybe it's getting to be late. Maybe we shouldn't have done it. I'm like, no, no, it's great. It's such a great idea. Who cares about like, time? <laughs> you, you came up with that. It was your idea. And then the cool thing about that track is that the track actually features Zoro's theme. So that's Zoro's theme. But it's surrounded within Mihawk's sonority. flamenco sonorities and grooves. So this way... Like just as the, there is that duel on screen, there is also kind of that duel and that dance happening musically between their themes and their sonorities. Mm -hmm. I love Mihawk. That I was a personal it. favorite track. Yeah, no, I like that one. Um, <laughs> Ed, you had a question too, right? I was going to ask if uh, if the reaction to One Piece has been the largest sort of reaction that you've experienced or was Witcher bigger or have you had this level of publicity before? Uh, I think it's different. I think it's different. Mm -hmm. um, I think Witcher was different because, so there was Toss a Coin and there was a mm -hmm. ton of coins with the Witcher. So I think it's pretty hard to top something like that mm -hmm. because, I mean, when you were number one on Billboard rock songs. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's mm -hmm. really you're getting, you're getting fun. So we have to, you're if, saying One Piece fans have to download more of, of your music. <laughs> well, first of all, something like that would never hurt. So <laughs> I'm always up for that. I think it's hard to compare because the projects are different. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's pretty even. Maybe in some areas Witcher had more. Maybe in some areas One Piece has more. It, it's hard to compare. Like, and also, like, what's the point of comparing? There are two completely different projects yeah. with their own identities and sounds. So, like, there's no reason to compare the two. They're so different. Mm -hmm. And also, like, Witcher, we love Witcher dearly. We love Toss a Coin, but now we're setting sail for One Piece. So, <laughs> exciting. You have the, the eyes siblings. To grand line. Yeah. yeah. We're ready for the Grand Line. Um. Okay, I'll make these quick because we've had you on for a while. I want to keep you guys too long on a Sunday. Um, okay, so we ask all our guests these. And since you're also One Piece fans, I also have to ask these for you. So first, who is your favorite straw hat? It could be of the future, past, or current for the live action, anime, manga, whatever. Oh, that's hard. We ask that, that's questions. a hard one. <laughs> Pick your favorite oh, child. Matt? <laughs> yeah. yeah it's like yeah pick your favorite child how can you answer that it's hard because if you said i mean it's not really a villain but my favorite is mihawk but it's not a straw hat well so, that was going to be my next question a non-straw hat if you want to answer that first you can correct so straw hat oh i don't have one i i cannot single one out because... like there are qualities okay let's just talk about this season because yeah you know i <laughs> there's so, there are many... <laughs> I haven't Sorry. mentioned how much I like Sanji's theme, by the way, but I want to at least say that while we're talking about straw hats. <laughs> like every straw hat has such a great qualities. Like Luffy always being so charismatic and optimistic. It's so I love him so dearly as a as a as a I mean as the captain, obviously. But then you have some someone like Zoro. Or you know, also ooze up and the whole. You're gonna journey. name all of them, are you? <laughs> oh, exactly. So it's like it's so it's so difficult to pin one down of the original straw hat. Yeah, tool. I I also I don't think I would be able to single one out because also like for us like we also approach it from a musical perspective, and for yeah. us to create music for every single one of them was such 
a joy equally, like take all the hurdy gurdies or banjos or fiddles for Luffy. I mean, come on, when yeah. you get to play around with a hurdy gurdy, I'll take it every day. Then uh, Zoro, for Zoro, he has three swords, right? So what we did is each sword is represented musically with a specific instrument. So, you know, as he's doing his sword action, there is kind of the same musical dance happening between his instruments. And that there's so much fun in that. Or Sanji, Sanji is big band, jazz, funk, fusion ensemble. Yeah, like because Sanji is kind of like so jazzy, so sassy, kind of elegant. <laughs> so we knew that we needed the jazz element to to his theme and also because he practices the kick-based martial art like imagine there is sanji doing his kicks and then there's jonah doing the same type of kicks on the drums so it, it was incredibly fun or usopp with the bluesy ukulele or like nami with the song so like from a musical perspective these are such different journeys but equally amazing and equally fulfilling so there's no way i can pick one yeah and also like <laughs> It's so hard because, like, I also love the interaction, like, the relationship in between them, like the whole banter between, take, Zoro and Sanji, or... Or Zoro and Luffy. And Zoro and Luffy, yeah. or take, you know, uh, also Usap and Luffy about who's really the captain and, you know, all yeah. that. So, I... There is tension amongst the crew, not a crew. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah it... there, you, you can't pick one, so... It's, it's hard, like... Yeah, I think we're settled. We can't pick one. Sorry, okay. sorry, guys. That's fine. I won't make you. <laughs> Although I did make you, so I, I don't know. Um... I think we answered the uh, you. I I know we got uh we got Giona's uh, answer for this, but who's your favorite non straw hat, Sonia? You cannot pick the same. Huh? No, you can't. I mean, you... <laughs> it's a rule. <laughs> no, I you mean, can. I don't care. Okay. Okay. Mihawk is fantastic. Buggy is fantastic. Kuro, oh my goodness. No, you cannot pick all the other ones. Can I pick? No, you're all picking all of them. Oh, no, 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 no. Please speak all of them. You know, buddy. option E, all of the above. <laughs> well, okay. I'm going to also ask, so maybe this will narrow it down for you. Who is your favorite antagonist? So I don't think Mihawk's completely an antagonist. So, yeah, I mean, anyway, so not I can debatable. answer again. Not, not, not a helpful he's, question. He's an antagonist. Uh, antagonist. Mm -hmm. Oh, for me, for antagonist, I would go with uh, Kuro. Like, I, yeah. I think the yeah. live action, I, my controversial opinion is I think the live action really improved upon the original manga when it came to Kuro's stuff. Um, I like, and also you, you guys have experience with horror um, and it, it does lean into campy horror, I guess is where oh, we're, we're, we're leaning. Into it stuff. did come across yeah. that way when you were watching. I remember my buddy said like, Oh, it has like very good, like horror, like a, and like I'm watching One Piece. Why? How did this turn into yeah. like a mansion horror uh, clue esque? Very you know, Freddy Krueger type. type moments with. Uh, it know. is. But it, I think it lands so well. I remember yeah. when we were watching first time when there is the whole sequence. For example, the all the windows shutting down. It's like it's so. In a way, it's so over top, but also it fits with Kuro's storyline for this season because, like, he's. I mean, in a way, he's a very scary character, if you think about it. Like, being so fast and he's so devious and so smart also at the same time. Uh, yeah. But yeah, for me, Kuro, as an antagonist, I'm like... I, I pick them all, sorry. I mean, so, 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 so. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. What that's I should it. be asking is, like, which character that has not yet shown up for all of these, because then you don't have your heart set on all of them since you worked on all of them, but I won't make you do that. Uh, <laughs> since we've been talking a while, I don't want to I want to keep you too long. I think the last question is, what is your favorite story arc? And I'm if it's all of them, too, I, I don't know. Oh, no. You mean of this season? Of this, yes. uh, yeah, that's for the season, I feel like, is the fair the question. I love the story arc between Zeph and Sanji. Oh, yeah, he's he's mm. still in my Like, I mean, if you think about it, the whole Zeph cutting off his leg for, you know, as a sacrifice for Sanji and the whole thing and the, their whole relationship. Uh, I think it's a, I mean, it's so powerful. It's so strong. It's such a standout. Yeah. Right? But at the same time, I mean, Nami's story arc is also very, I mean, Right, so I think those two story arcs for me, I love those. Well, unfortunately, I, I, I'm not going to say creative here, but I do have the same answer because I was about to say Sanji and Zev. Like that storyline, it's so kind of over the top about, you know, Zev cutting, the, cutting his own leg. But there is 
so much emotion and heart to that storyline because like their relationship is so complex and they're you know they're on one hand so impossibly both stubborn and so different but at the same time maybe not they're not that different after all because they've got the same dream and that's really what connects them and binds them together and like once both of them get to realize that they're still gonna bicker they're still going to like scream at each other but at the same time they love each other so dearly so it's it's so beautiful i guess in kind of like looking at that story arc but obviously nami's story arc i mean you cannot compare it because they're so different correct very different it's such a dramatic story arc such a traumatic story arc you know with everything that she had to go through but then the fact that she got through this and she succeeded and then along the process she met her new family our straw heads that's so emotionally beautiful and that's why like bringing in the song like in the song when we have i'm coming home it's fun because like it's a double meaning like on one hand she was literally going back to coco village but then on the other hand you know where it happened in episode eight like now she has her family her new family she found her home she found her home and she's back home because after so many years of being stranded at sea being lost at sea not knowing where her way is with only stars pointing her way and you know having to navigate through all these rough and raging waters now she's finally she found her family she found her peace and she's back home yes sorry (laughs) Don't want to take away from the answer. I like the dramatic ones. <laughs> no, it just came to my mind. Going back to the previous question about who's your favorite straw hat, do you consider <laughs> the Goy Mary a straw hat member? Yeah. Yes. yes. No, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Well, then the, well, then the Goy Mary, obviously. <laughs> uh, Good answer. Like, well, Good the Goy Mary, yeah. because it's the one that kind of like glues, takes them also, you know, brings them, um, you know. Well, and he has his own theme. And when we're in episode... He? Well, the going Mary okay. has its own scene, May. Eh? Uh, when we're in episode eight, when there is the scene at the uh, the barrel, when they're making the pledge of, mm-hmm. you know, what, uh, that scene features the theme of going Mary. But every single time we cut to each one of our straw heads, we feature their instrumentation incorporated mm. within that. That's cool. So, it's, but but it also it also shows up in episode four the going Mary theme. Yes, but I'm talking about that one. Oh, okay, so, yeah, because so. it's it's cool how it's all incorporated within their own individual yeah. instrumentation within the overall going Mary theme. But yeah, so my answer to that would be the going Mary. I'm sticking. To, <laughs> I'm sticking to my answer. All of them. Appreciate that. Um, thank you both for being so generous with your time, and I could talk to you both, and I'm sure we all can for another few hours, but I don't want to make you do that. Because uh, there's a lot of One Piece. I don't know if you heard. Um, we're Are there literally... just, I think there are only like 150 episodes. Oh, yeah. No, that's just like, yeah. just like, an easy. 150 would be a lot. You're missing, a, missing a zero there. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite, but get in there. Um, I, I really hope we get the chance to see what you two do in future seasons. Because mm-hmm. as you've already hinted at a lot of them. Um, and things just get so much crazier and wilder for those who are just starting the adventure, really the tip of the iceberg here. Um, so I thank you, uh, Sonia and Giona for your time and, uh, please watch one piece on Netflix and listen, just listen to the soundtrack and make sure it beats everything else (laughs) on the billboards because we, we're not competitive, but we are. Yes, um, we are. We are. We are. We are. We are. <laughs> we are. I think that's a good place to leave it. Thank you both. <laughs> thank awesome. you so much. Thank, thank, thank you, you guys. So thank you. Thank so you. Much. <laughs> good. All right. Good. Oh, that was fun. That was so much fun, guys. Thank you so much. Anytime. <laughs> if you need to talk about One Piece, that's what we're here for. <laughs> no, this was. I was tempted. I was tempted to say at the end there might be giants, but I was like, I don't want to give away. <laughs> there might be giants. So I was like, oh, my it's. Mind. It's just crazy to think, like, uh, I think I heard, like, the spoilers of this, you know, uh, just being, like, things that happened 20 years ago in in actual time for us or more. It's just like, oh, Nami is really working for her long. It's like, oh, wow, yeah, I guess that is a spoiler for someone who is, <laughs> it's just such a different, Yeah. it's been a different yeah. mindset. <laughs> 
same. Like when people are like, oh, don't spoil. I'm like, define spoil. Like you can go yeah. back, watch the anime or the manga. <laughs> yeah. It's a I mean, the there. Giants did happen in like 2001. So I don't know if that's. Exactly. So it's like. It's, yeah. they, they've been around. They've yeah. been around. But yeah, yeah, I cannot. I mean, honestly, we cannot wait because, as you oh, said, yeah. the more the show progressed, the crazier and funnier I think it gets. So the music I could imagine getting to be a lot of fun and You're... some really crazy instruments. I'm sure. I am there even more excited about, a... about what you guys are going to do for that because like... I hope to see it. Yeah. You're talking about horror stuff, and I'm just thinking about Thriller Bark and the oh. potential for that. Yeah. No, but Thriller Bark isn't horror. Thriller Bark is like horror comedy. It's like a... yeah, I mean yes. If we put it this way too, like the going back Although to like live what you guys are doing with like Buggy too, like just having it said in that in that key, which is always off tune, like it gave more of like a horror vibe to it because it was just like you know scary clowns and... instead well, of makes... incompetent clowns. Yeah. It makes uh, him a threat. It makes him right. a threat as opposed made to him just feel a goober. That's why I said the music, I think, made him more of a threat oh, than yeah. the series made him a threat. I mean, he is more. I mean, I guess at the beginning of the manga, too, you forget. But, yeah. I think also in the live action with all the cinematography and the color correction, yeah. it's a bit more threatening yeah. as a character mm -hmm. compared to the manga and, live act and the anime. And clearly we helped on that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, that came off very clearly when I was like that. And if we say with Kuro, too, I was being just like, oh, why am I actually not scared? The one thing, the one thing and people have said, and hopefully it could be in a future arc, is the Shushu stuff with the dog in the buggy mm. arc that was in there, in there. Because that would get me a good cry. That always, that story well, always. There was yeah. there. There was a dog there, I think. Yeah. But, uh, there was a dog. Yeah. Yes. There was a dog. Very briefly, but like, which is fine for me. There is no it way you can incorporate quick. all of it because there are just so mm -hmm. many things. No, done. I know. I, I get it. Like, <laughs> I love like, that what? this is a different thing. Like, I yeah. do really like that. That this is like, for... we tried, we tried as much as, as soon as there was an opportunity. Like, for example, we have a theme for Kabaji. He's not that much in, live, in the live action, but he's enough present that yeah. it, it was an opportunity to do it so that when he comes back again, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was just gonna say, emoji? <laughs> are you emoji? <laughs> from Mo Moji, the 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 Beast Man guy. Oh yeah, uh, who has I, his I, tiger I, or his yeah his lion who's not there. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I can't yeah. believe we live in a day and age where Nazumi has a theme. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> like that character specifically. I, I was like, what? Yeah. Like watching Nazumi, I was like, more. I was like, I actually like his hood, and I'm like, I'm mad. I'm like, I want this man to go away, but I'm just like, I like the outfit. He was the worst in the original. Like you just oh, gosh. like, he's he's bad, but you're right. He he does. He's slightly cooler considering no, his whiskers. He's not cooler at he's... all. Like still bottom tier, but like the the hat <laughs> hood thing. I was like, what if I made myself? What if... You're going. What if you to, did? Probably. It is really cool. And I remember when we watched it first, like we were so happy because like they kept Nazumi look so, uh, I mean, so close to how we've been all seeing him, you know, for all these years. So I was like, yes, with all the whisk and yeah. the ears. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's, that's been the, the yeah. biggest thing I've heard from people is like people who like know of One Piece, they look at like Mary, they look at Nazumi, they're being like, you see all those prosthetics and you're like, so excited you're like they did it right or like the wigs being ridiculous and you have like people who have never seen one piece are like why does a wig look weird that looks bad <laughs> but, like, we have to, like sit them down and explain them, like no 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 this is this is how it is <laughs> one piece is weird and that's part of the reason we like yeah it. did you see the giant snails that have human mouths and talk uh -huh. like, i love the hell out of them because of how creepy and, and weird yes some of my favorite parts of that I um, love that they use puppets for that. Because I want one of those so badly. Same. same. How did they just... not give you two any uh, actual transponder snails? Well, you know, they are still, they're planning to still use them. So. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's ridiculous. That's... <laughs> Oda got one. You both should get one. I think that's... Yeah. Well, music there. themed transponders yeah. yes, yes. That, yeah that should be the gift to everyone. just like a, a bluetooth stereo or something like at the very <laughs> least like little music box yeah oh yeah you crank it and then it it speaks the words oh, that's creepy actually <laughs> yes, i know they're making excellent. like you can buy like the transponder so i'm like i don't know if i want that in my house i got like a plushy one and it's very cute uh but i don't know if i want the one from the live action because i'm like that thing scares me a little bit <laughs> uh, but then like again, that's why i do way. want it yeah 
Okay, I want to let you two yes. go. I know we've been talking for a while. Yeah, we yeah, don't. We, can... we don't shut up. Is one of the mm-hmm. problems. Um, uh, the same. <laughs> oh, so well, thank, thank you guys. This was so much fun. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So much fun. It's great oh, yeah. having you both. It was great. Yeah. Thank you again. <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. Peace. Bye. Talk Bye. Soon. Bye. <laughs>
a static sound or something <laughs> over this. I'm not going to request anything, but it would be funny. Um, <laughs> but no, we're here kind of now to just go through it all. And I think probably people would probably more likely watch the first eight episodes than listen to however long these podcasts are going to go. And speaking of going long, why don't we just get into it? Yes. So We should. Like Doja Cat. Get into it. Yeah. I have no idea what that is. That's okay. I'm keeping you hip. Okay. It's a song. So let's start with episode one. I thought title. we would start with episode seven. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah, I kind of just do them and like, you know, just pick them out of a hat. Yeah. Anyway. Episode re- 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 <laughs> Ah, monkey D. Luffy, everybody. Episode one, Romance Dawn. And uh, this one's written by Matt Owens, Steve Maeda. Direct- director is Mark Jobs. And I realize I'm probably going to mispronounce names as we go along. So uh, I apologize. Uh, Thankfully, I don't think anyone involved is going to listen to this. So No. But maybe... Mihawk's actor will because he's going out there finding all the fan content right now <laughs> commenting on those yaoi pictures if only this was a visual medium yeah. podcast. no i think they call those videos yeah content content <laughs> so what content baby so episode one kicks off uh we're at, uh we get uh some narration here and that is uh ian mcshane very interesting choice. I'm surprised people still remember that he was Blackbeard in the fourth parts of the Caribbean movie. When did that? What what happened in that one? Uh, Is that where they get married? No, that's the third one. Uh, oh, the uh, Orlando Bloom and uh, are they in and Karen Knightley are not in this one. Is this one the mermaids? Yes, the, I... one of the mermaids and what's her name? Penelope Cruz. I didn't care about it. I cared about most people didn't. Will and what's her face. Will and Karen Of course you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they they were formative to me. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Uh, Brodsky told me he's in. The, uh, he's. Uh, um, Didn't you see any what's... John Wicks? Yep. Yeah, the first one. You remember I the guy who runs the hotel? It was a, it was an average movie to me. <sighs> <laughs> this is the year we both seen John Wick for the first time. I've seen all the movies. You only seen the first one. Yeah. I can't believe that first one didn't. Have a, have an effect on you the way it did me. That was a that was a good time. Uh, Maybe because I watched it at like seven in the eight, seven in the morning while I was hungover. Yeah, and I that's was not, like really the nah, dog. It's like watching a movie when you're sleepy. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we kick off. Uh, we're at Logtown and we see the uh, execution of Gold Roger, and uh, and you know who's there? Monkey D Garp looking yeah. like a fucking baddie. Um, Garp is, is included. Is Garp in, in there in in the original? No. You're, you're gonna have to be my eyes and ears on what it like because eventually everything just sort of blends together, and I'm like, what happened sure. when? Um, yeah, Garp doesn't. We don't. We don't know he exists literally until Water Seven, right, or the end of it. Uh, no, or, we we know Garp exists from uh, Kobe and Helmeppo's cover story. Oh, but we okay. don't know the well, but we don't know the relation of Garp to Luffy until the end of you know. You're right. You're right. I was. And he's lobby water That's seven. What it was. Yeah. I'm what gonna, the... I'm gonna be honest. I didn't pay attention in most of the cover stories when I s- was speed reading One Piece. Shame on you. I know. It's, it's okay. <laughs> I've. I think I've forgotten the content of a lot of them. Uh, but you know, I, I'll blame Toye for not adapting them. Uh, it would have been would have been cute. Anyway, we're not so, here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the yeah. So the opening scene, uh, of course, you know, because the first thing you see in the One Piece manga anime is the execution of Gold Roger. Uh, you know, in the manga, it's the first pages. In the anime, it's in We Are. Um, and yeah, this one, it's kind of a it's its own interpretation because Garp is included in here. Uh, you're gonna be seeing a lot of Garp in this show. Um, and also, this is like an adaptation of the stuff that happens in Chapter Zero, because it's cameos galore. You have Mihawk, Shanks, Buggy. Uh, I know Smoker's in there. Smoker, that was a, a Logtown anime filler. Uh, and I, the it, <laughs> some people on Twitter might tell you Crocodile was there, but I think that's just a woman, folks. Especially because that woman's is standing in front of the actual cameo, Young Shanks. I do, yeah. I was like, I think she's there to 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 be the pan over. Mm-hmm. But 
I've expressed my opinions on the Croco Mom theory many a time. We don't we don't gotta get into no. it. No. And uh Gold Roger, wow, does he look uh he smelly. Look, yeah, he looks surly. He's got the yellow teeth and all that. Grimy pirate. Um He looks like if I was at a convention, he'd be like, Where's my hug? <laughs> <laughs> this is like probably what people used to think gold like what the original gold roger was before we became sure, yeah. uh daddyfied in uh the odin flashback i like imagining that the greasy old roger is uh what people tell in myths of him so like he's got this grizzled look and it's what the marines want you to think yeah and then how he actually looks is he's just like hee hee i'm just a silly little guy and you're like wow i kind of like handsome. that as, it, as it's gone on that's my yeah. that's my like how i make those two things work in my brain but I, I I don't think uh, it's, I don't think that nuance is is there in this opening scene. But yeah, it kind of plays out as it is. It's not word for word what he says in the manga or like in the four kids uh, intro either. But uh, yeah, you know he set, you know inspires a bunch of people and they just immediately start running. Uh, people start running and heading out to see. You even see Mihawk's little coffin ship too. And uh, that's our opening scene, and we get the title. And then we cut to Luffy, uh, age 17 Luffy, out at sea, uh, talking with uh, a news coup. Uh, basically, a lot of the dialogue that he says at the end of uh, the original chapter one, saying, like, I need a crew, about 10 men will do, and all that. And this is uh, Anaki Godoy as Monkey D. Luffy. And uh, what do you think of him? He's adorable. Um, I think he has really good Luffy energy. I know that people were talking about, like, a lot of the marketing has definitely been, like, look how great the cast has chemistry with each other. Like, aren't they so much just like their own characters? And I wonder how much of that is, like, acting for the for the content and how much of that is, like, true. But Inaki just, like, has the personality of Luffy down. It's, it's you know, like, whatever. The scene where he's talking at the camera slash bird is, like, a little cheesy, but mm. it's one piece. I, I don't know. I, I, would, for me. I don't know. I feel like I could tell, like, you know, because there's a lot of, you know, created content. <laughs> it's on the internet. It's like, do this quirky thing. I, I don't know. I didn't. I, I think, like, Inaki, he's Luffy for a reason. And I feel like just that's just yeah. naturally his personality. For sure. Uh, yeah. And it's a fun little scene where, you know, it's a little, you know, reveal that, you know, he's just talking to a, a bird and, you know, he's off to a rough start. Especially off to a rough start when there's a hole in his boat and he gets in the barrel. We all know. Well, it doesn't yeah. quite play out like that. He doesn't bust his way out of a barrel the same way he does in the original story. And then we cut to uh, the, the scene of the Alveda pirates attacking another ship. Uh, in the original episode that we recorded on this, I was like, ooh, the show felt a little gory. I watched it again. It wasn't so bad. Maybe I was just tired. And It's it's a lot of that- implied yeah, goriness. I think it was um, the sound effects were really squelchy when we were at the pier. And I was like, Ugh, yeah, Ugh. but it, it didn't bother me so much this time. Um, Alvita's great. She's fun. I uh, I hope that whenever, you know, we see her again and she gets cool powers, I, I imagine that they will adopt it in a way where they don't have her like magically lose weight. I don't think I would go with that. I, I've seen some people like speculating how, the, you know, you know, whatever, if it makes her like ch- shiny, I, I, I don't. <laughs> I she don't really know. stands out in the live action. I think, you know, I got to admit, like uh, Alveda, you know, getting the slip slip ability and getting thinner. She just looks like every other One Piece female. Mm-hmm. And we all know the whole thing about Oda drawing similar women, but. Then again, like Alvita hasn't really had a whole lot to do in the story since Logtown. She just hangs out with Buggy, uh, living but, the dream. But what's uh, I think? Well, it, it started with Roger, but then it became apparent here with Alvita. A lot of these uh, characters are introduced with uh, wanted posters that kind of are like fourth wall breaky. Like the characters interact with them, they like smack them or tear them out of the way. But uh, yeah, Alvita is like pretty intimidating here, and uh, they're after Zoro in this. Uh, and uh, name dropping uh, Sixus Island, uh, which is where Ace and Mass Deuce were 
stranded. Yeah, that's a deep pull. I have an ace tattoo, and I was even like, what the fuck are they talking about? <laughs> well, I read that first book, and even yeah, I, I was like, what the hell, Six is Island? But uh, there's going to be a lot of that in this show. They, uh, I think they try to really flesh the world out by name dropping a lot of locations and stuff um and then you know of course uh you know kobe has to clean up a, a bunch of brains and mush that alvita just smashed uh and uh yeah then we get you know kobe in the show he's a little darling he is i think uh kobe's actor they have i love the the kobe luffy chemistry i think that's so fun i think the two of them have like i don't know just like the way they play off each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, Morgan Davies is playing Kobe in this. He, he they they always seem like a, like they they seem like they're like a scared little dog out in the cold. Kobe is always just hunched yeah. over, nervously looking to their left and their right. But then <laughs> I, I, I like as the I know we're getting ahead. Of, I'm getting ahead of myself. But like as as the show progresses, I feel like they literally like physically open up. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, exude the confidence that Kobe begins to like get instilled. It's, it's they really just fucking laid the Marine stuff on pretty heavy yeah. in the, in, in the whole series. Um, well, then we get to, uh, you know, it's at night and down in the brig, I think is when Luffy busts out of, uh, the barrel, not in a grand comedic way. Like I said in the original story, but shocks Kobe, and then like it kind of plays out similar to the first anime episode of them kind of like hidden in there, and you know Luffy's eating food, and Luffy introduces himself, uh, and just really like with a lot of gusto, I gotta say, like I think Anaki was really kind of nailing the character this early on, and you know and. Like and like similar to the story, like Luffy says he's a pirate, and Kobe, Kobe's idea of a pirate is probably what most people's perceptions of pirates are—just very nasty, uh, brutal, you know, monsters of the sea. And that leads, and that, and Luffy says like, not the pirates I know, and that leads to the first part of his flashback, or what we know, or chapter one in the manga, and. Uh, yeah, we get the uh, you know we get the introduction of Shanks here and the red haired pirates and Luffy uh, stabbing himself underneath the eye. Um, it's not really played comical. Uh, no. In this episode, I and and maybe maybe this is more accurate to how like little kids are. Like uh, Kid Luffy here is very just moody and just wincing most of the time. Just like like. Definitely like a, a cranky kid kind of vibe. Um, but I remember like Luffy kind of stabbing himself uh, under the eye is played for laughs in uh, the manga. But I guess maybe it just really doesn't come off that way yeah, <laughs> in live really action. Yeah, you can portray that so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah. Because uh, we get some of the... Because the, the flashback is kind of sprinkled out through this episode and episode two so we do kind of see like the the higuma stuff as well when he comes in and it's not it's not as direct like higuma doesn't like break a bottle over shanks and all that he just sort of spills it yeah and uh which is i guess much less offensive yeah it's like i, I almost, they should have broken it over it al- i was like they're already going for the edgy like yeah it almost makes more sense that like shanks is like why the hell am i gonna you know <laughs> yeah, get sure. into a fight here um but yeah and then you know luffy and kobe are are caught you know walking around the ship and this leads to uh the luffy and alvita fight and it's our first uh it, it's our first time witnessing the uh his powers his powers we do see him eat the devil fruit though in this episode right and it it's <laughs> it's very shiny it looks like uh yeah. mem- remember that meme everything is cake that's what it, <laughs> it does look like it was cake. very green on the inside of that gum gum fruit mm-hmm. yeah um didn't look appetizing which apparently you know they're not supposed to be no I mean, he ate the whole thing he did um trooper but yeah we get to see luffy stretchy powers in uh live action and yeah not too bad i i think this film this film was uh, this this scene was also filmed you know 
meant to be filmed like meant to be at night so i think they could get away with a lot of heavy shadows and stuff but yeah it looked pretty good you know and the the hit on alvita like god the way she like flopped out of the ship that seemed like it hurt it was painful so then we're introduced to zoro and nami let's talk about them played by uh mccann and emily rudd Sorry, I was thinking about all the things I wanted to say about Emily Rudd, but well, you should make, oh, <laughs> well, be nice. You know? No, they're all wonderful things. I think she was great. She stole the show. Um, I okay, so I feel like they definitely with Zoro. They were like, okay, somebody here has to be the subject of the TikTok fan cams. I need you to work. The, I think his like stage direction was just be like pout harder is it uh, brood harder is that how you analyze it i just think of uh you got to beat the badass i mean yeah um listeners at home and across america and wherever the fuck else you are uh my mother started watching the one piece live action so i've been checking in with her to be like did you like did you get sanji yet did you did you get did you get sanji she keeps being like no but she has been into other things um and I was like, what do you think of Zoro? She was like, oh, you know, he's fine. He's the sword guy. And that's when I was like, damn, he is so much more than the sword guy to me normally. Same. I don't know. He's, yeah. But he's definitely the sword guy here. He, I, like, I was feeling a little bit like, damn, I was worried he uh, didn't have as much humor. He doesn't have his, like, silly, goofy laughs or whatever, which he doesn't really ever do after mihawk but he i think they're trying to go for like a dry humor with him there's a there's some parts where i'm like oh he was making a joke yeah his, <laughs> his, for, for his, his, his performance uh you know i don't know what to think going into this and then getting a very yeah you know, this, this kind of draw all day here <laughs> hey He's like, I don't, I don't make friends with pirates. No, uh, I, I definitely not, warm up to uh, him as he warms up to the rest of the crew. Like later, he definitely on. warms up like the slowest, I would yes. say, which is which is weird because Nami, we all know what happens with Nami in yes. the story. Yes. Um, um, what's interesting about Zoro's introduction in the series is it is a, it is a canon scene that is hinted about way later in the in the Alabasta arc. Only mention of uh, the original Mister Seven confronting Zoro about joining Baroque Works and Zoro killing him. I thought that was something really cool and something like, "Wow, this is what the live action should do." Is really kind of take advantage of some things that we never have seen before. Yeah. Um. And you you want to talk about the uh, implied gore and stuff, Mister Seven? He just s- split in twain. Yeah. Uh, very violent. Uh, no geysers he's of Mr. blood. Mr. Three and a half now. You stole that joke from Jill. I didn't see that Jill. I, sorry, Jill. You made the same joke. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. I thought you stole that because Jill yeah. said that. It was very funny. And it was very funny when you said it too. But okay. I heard it well, I'm not funny. Get uh, Jill in here. Tap, tap her in. <laughs> but uh, it'll be a little hard to do at this stage. Uh <laughs> You contemplated it for a second and you were like, you know what? Who would talk about this? Jill. I can go back to playing Baldur's Gate. <laughs> so Zoro, yeah, but Zoro, God, he, he flips the bird. And that would like, I, that's, I sounds like such a proof, but if that feels like such like a, yeah. Oh yeah. Doesn't I'm he do that? So cool. When does he do that? Um, I think it's just like it he, he talks like, about it is like with, with uh, it's like it's like do you all have to get like numbers tattooed on your face? Oh I yeah, he's like I one, prefer number and, one. And he flips them off. And I was like okay, and I was like, oh, <laughs> to me, I was like I don't know because I'm the kind of person that felt that way about guess what Trafalgar Law like <laughs> in one of his first scenes in Shabondi when he just flips off kid and i'm like i have a print of that in my living room yeah so. i know <laughs> i feel i don't know to me it always felt a bit much but we can get into how this well this isn't uh typical one piece that's for sure and 
uh emily's first scene as nami is fun it's the same it's basically the same scene where she tricks those buggy pirates mm-hmm. though i don't think those are buggy pirates no they are they looked like it they looked like them but did they have the jolly roger on that ship i don't think so uh, you never see them again i don't know never see them again i got to get i while watching it, i was like oh yeah that's my implication but you know there's so many things where i want to pick the mind of a casual watcher who just hasn't ever experienced one piece to be like what did this mean to you you know I, that's something we kind of didn't talk about at the top of the show which i should have is it's gonna be i i have to admit it will be hard to critique this series because of the knowledge i have of the source material yeah I, so I feel like we definitely should have said this at the top. I feel like we're going to have to split our review of this. I've had to like hold this in two different places in my mind. And the one place is that like how it stands on its own as a show. Yeah. Um, Just like as a form of entertainment and not as an ad, you know, not as an adaptation, just like as a form of television. And in that I was like, yeah, it was pretty entertaining. Yeah. And then I have how I think of it as a way they've remixed and adapted the story of one piece. And I will just fucking say it point blank. Cause I'm not going to beat around the bush with how I feel. I'm sort of like, Oh, the people who made this enjoy one piece for entirely different reasons than I do. And that's not me making jokes about like shipping or whatever. That's me making like, I'm like, Oh, okay. You guys, y'all are here for the fights. That's crazy. It feels like, I've just, I'm just going in on it. Um, it sort of feels like the show is your older sibling or like a kid on the playground who's Guy older at than the you. Gym. Who now, you know, so, someone who's like, I gotta tell you about the super badass thing, Mike. You know, I watched the other day and they retell it to you, but in a way where they're like sort of changing it a little bit to be like, this is why it's so badass. This is why it's so cool. And you should really be into it. Did I ever tell you how, so, and I felt so bad because I came off like probably such an aggravated asshole and probably because I am. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember a coworker of mine. It was so funny because this was back when no one was really talking about One Piece. Uh, and you were the, the One Piece guy. Yeah. But of course, no one really knew that because no one knew what One Piece. Sure. This guy, awkward fella, tried pitching another coworker One Piece. And what do, what do you think is like a good hook for One Piece? Like what's like the what's, what's, it's, what's like a it's, scene? What's like a like a uh, scene? Get to, well, I always tell people if you get to Arlong Park and it doesn't move you, you're probably not gonna enjoy the emotional core. And then I say if you get to Alabasta and you don't like it, just drop it because there's no point. This guy's pitch was uh, Luffy fights a guy who's made of sand and he can't hit him because he's made out of sand, but he's weak to water. So then eventually Luffy's hands are covered in blood and that's how he's able to hit him. And I'm like, cool. Uh, like that's an int- like that's a really nice twist that you just that's put- great with build. Also, why should I care about who this person is? It's it's not about yeah. cool f- it's not about cool punchies. It's about the the people me, throwing the punchies. I don't. I, I mean, I don't know what it's like classified wherever, but like to me, one piece is an adventure story that it be, through the fact that their pirates has to have fights is not a battle shown in where I am like, cool. I get some plot sometimes. Like it's it's the exact opposite. I'm like I get plot, and then I'm like, oh, okay, they're fighting now or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's. But you know, I play Dungeons and Dragons for the role playing and not the number crunching. And yeah, everyone me too. Gets, everyone gets. <laughs> That's a, yeah. Ways. I'm I'm more for the RP stuff, not for the uh, the battling. But uh, yeah, it's like, but that leads us into talking with the Shellstown adaptation. I can't talk about Shellstown without. I'm trying to talk about Shellstown. Can we talk about Shellstown now? Just, well, can we talk to, about like just like, what it did well? Yeah, because like it, like we're gonna try our best to critique this both in a. I think it's a good, you know, some, this is some fun television. The, the bar scene with the three of them was a good way to introduce all three of their characters in a way where you immediately get what they're about. Mm-hmm. I thought the whole like, oh, now nah, you're too tall for me bit with Nami was very funny because at first I was like, gay? And then I was like, oh. Uh, She's trying to like find the right uh, <laughs> Marine to yeah. steal their outfit, their uniform. Yeah. She's funny. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know. I the set designs I think are really cool. The costumes all look really great. I think the character interactions are, are a lot of fun. Like 
Uh, Anaki really is the glue in this first episode because... More like the rubber cement. Oh. We should title the episode Rubber Cement, just saying. Wow, that's really appealing. <laughs> um, yeah, because everyone's kind of just... He's the goofy one, and everyone else is kind of pretty straight face. That's so. why he's Monkey D. Goofy. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of... like I realize I'm like, oh, are they just like... Was their intention like, oh, we have the certain funny characters act funny. Not everyone mm-hmm. is act funny. And, but that's the, that's one of the things I like about One Piece is, and anyone could be a goofball. It's a comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, anyone can cook. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I beg to differ. Um, that's true. You've, you've had my cooking. <laughs> <laughs> so... But what, it, yeah, just what it leads to is just these three kind of coming together and Luffy's trying to get this map to the Grand Line. Every, everyone's trying to get this map of the Grand Line and it's kind of a big, uh, I wouldn't say it's a, uh, it's a heist kind of thing. It's a, it's a whole lot of things going on. Um, but yeah, by the end of it, you have like a crew, even a reluctant crew mm-hmm. of that, uh, Kobe stays behind, you know, after, uh disappearing through we're we're missing the the greatest scene in the whole episode the funniest scene in the whole Helmeppo's, fucking episode yeah ass. we first of all i would like to give a shout out to Helmeppo's actor i'm glad that they leaned into him just being ridiculous in he's a, a total like, ham yeah. in this episode what's the what's the wrestling word or whatever heel yeah he's like a shit heel yeah, yeah, or whatever. That's what Barjo was. Yeah, the way he was. laughs, he seems like he unhinges his whole jaw. Like he <laughs>, laughs with his entire mouth yes. open. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, that was a, that was a good impression. Thank you. Thank you. I've been practicing it. Mi- a- I've been practicing in the mirror like Helmeppo practices his sword play. <laughs> oh, you know what? I naked. I would have loved to see Zoro and Helmeppo's sword play. <laughs> I mean, I, I we could talk about all the intentions of Zoro's character in this show, but uh, I, the, 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 I don't know. Zoro walking in on Helmeppo naked in his bedroom, uh, there, there's a lot of connotations there. You uh, know, everyone across the Grand Line and the real world is trying to get their hands on Zoro's swords. <laughs> but I did enjoy like the the fight choreography because it can't just be people just doing attacks over and over again. You know, there's a lot of defensive stuff a lot of like dodging and stuff and luffy's a lot of fun to watch because he's like rolling over people yeah. and he's you know he's being a little scam and dodging yeah i i really enjoyed the fight choreography a lot mm-hmm. uh we had fun to watch like yeah like luffy nami and zoro taking on those marines and then like taking on morgan himself who's uh i think he was i think he was played the right way he was yeah. definitely a ham a i bit. i enjoyed the uh this the scene with Nami being like, I wanted to work on Deuce or like mm-hmm. that, that was And he's just like good, he's such a narcissist. Bits. He's like, Oh, all right, yeah. Yeah. Keep talking. Uh I think it's like a really it's like it is a jam packed episode. I think it's it slightly is. longer than most. They have to fit so much in there. I remember feeling dizzy even after like the first time we watched it. Dizzy from like like, oh my god, so much. Yeah, definitely happened. yeah. I remember watching at the premiere and starting to feel like, oh I'm so full, but there's still so much left. <laughs> Um, but it's really fun. How is it though, as an adaptation of Shell's Town? <laughs> okay, so I I alluded to this on the last episode that we did about this. I said I needed to sit with my feelings and see how they sort of resolve this. I I, I okay. I mean, I don't know. They. <sighs> I feel like so many plot points in the story, which are the major emotional impact plot points, get remixed in a way where they still vaguely happen, but for completely different reasons. And I feel like it kind of takes away the gravity of the situation. I think Shellstown might be the most egregious. I gotta I gotta rewatch and think about um, Syrup Village. The stuff they did with Arlong Park, I was like, why do they do that? But it's not the worst. I'm like, okay, this worst is the strongest. But for me, Shell's Town introduces a character who, I mean, you get the, he, your first impression is big, bad, brooding guy, whatever. Um, 
And he is out there specifically for, like, selfless reasons. He's out there because if he's not out there strung up on his punishment, a little girl and her family are going to be, you know, attacked or Mm -hmm. whatever. Killed. Killed, yes. Um, Luffy is impressed by his like resolve and kindness when he sees this little this little girl because I keep coming back to this people in one piece do selfless acts for each like that, that's the, the whole point of of so many kind like wonderful things in one piece are strangers doing things they don't have to do to like help other people in a world that is so selfish and full of pirates and full of marines where every it's like every man for themselves and this little girl who you know is is thanking him sneaks in to risk being injured again um and he eats the food off the ground out of appreciation um partially because he's you know starving and partially because he's not going to waste like that kindness um and luffy's impressed by that he's impressed by like his his morals and his um the kindness of that and then we you know whatever we don't have to adapt luffy going and looking for the swords that's all fine it's just specifically like the reason why zoro's out there and then like him saying like him being you know utterly shocked that oh my god what do you mean axan morgan's gonna leave me out here to die like we get that in the live action that's fine it's just changing it to be like I'm out here so I can get my bounty. Like he, he I don't. The reason why he turns himself in is because they get him like at a catch twenty two. Like he's screwed. It's like oh, it's like oh, you're, it's like yeah, it's like you can collect your bounty, but you did beat up a bunch of marines and that's punishable. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, he, you could like bust out of here, but then I'll make sure like no marine base ever uh, gives you bounty. Like you know, pays you, know. you ever again, and he's just like, oh, I'm screwed. I guess I'll just I'll take the punishment. He's doing it for himself. He's not doing it for Rika. Yeah. yeah, and then and the Rika scene is still there, but it's really only there just to show that. Yeah, like he he's is a, kind in that he scene. Is kind. It's yeah. like okay, I, I feel like he in both scenes, you know, the food is is trampled on or whatever, and Zoro still eats it out of appreciation to this this child. But one of them is like an appreciation for like her risking herself. To, to to help him mm-hmm. and the other is oh this is the right thing to do for this kid and this mean bully just you know yeah it's like two different emotional stakes and like is it earth shattering does it ruin the story no it just i was like oh well that's what impressed that is what impressed me about zoro's character to begin with that is what right. i was like oh this loyalty he has for other people and then t- turns to luffy because like luffy does this like and saves him um, is what like solidifies Zoro so much as a character mm-hmm. people respect him so much because like he has such solid morals that like aren't about money yeah. because if he was like oh I'm gonna take this marine or I'm, I'm gonna take this punishment from the marine so I can catch my bounty those bitches out there who are like yeah Zoro's gonna kill Luffy and collect his bounty like that I feel like that's that same thought process people have yeah I'm, I'm, like, like, I'm like oh so these are the people that think like oh uh yeah, Zoro's gonna collect Luffy's bounty or stuff like uh and then, someone's gonna betray the Straw Hats or Jimbei's gonna die. It's kinda like I think also Luffy specifically says, I thought you were so cool because you seem so strong when you fight, which is again, yeah. you're you're my eyes and ears on remembering actually what happens and what what's He what's does say oh, you're a pretty good fighter, you know. He doesn't bring up hey um, the the scene with Rika and the rice bowls happens like so quickly and is like never really mentioned ever again. It's almost like it didn't happen. And like he eats them off the ground, but I feel like he almost does it just to make Helmeppo look yes. bad. Yes. He doesn't like it, it. Like he doesn't really like. Same. It, it's like an entirely different. Con- it almost looks like he does it to look bad. <laughs> he doesn't do it yeah. out of empathy. And that just really. Oh, no, he me. does turn to Rika and he says delicious. So I don't know. It just by. Like that small, I, I think the small change like that exemplifies like 
how even like the slightest changes in storytelling can like have different effects. Now, this is probably me being like a, a turbo insane One Piece head that is like this, but this is why I'm thinking about like what gripped me so hard to fucking read One Piece in six weeks. You know, mm-hmm. like what what could it have done it, and then what could have gripped you so hard to be talking about it for fucking fifteen years now or whatever. Um, and I, it's just the little moments. And I think it probably wouldn't be so critical if it just wasn't like every fucking, I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'm sorry. No, it's cool. It's, it's a, I was going to say it's a Monday. It's not a Monday, but you know, cranky. It's, it's Monday somewhere. It's, it's Monday somewhere. RIP Jimmy Buffett. Miss you guy. Miss you guy, dude. Bro. Man. Yeah. They should have put sorry. Jimmy Buffett in the live action one piece. No, it, running away with a couple uh, margaritas. He could have been in the background at the bar having a couple margaritas with kabaji or something. We don't know if he was a fan. Ma- yeah, he, that man, lived his life up in Key West. And, and p- listen, as a Floridian, he would have loved it. They, t- he, I think he would have. Yeah, I think he would have vibed with that Luffy he, fella. Jimmy Buffett and Jim Bay would be buds. I think so. I think yeah. Jim Bay is a Jimmy Buffett guy. And Jim Bay Buffett. And you know, I think he he like Robin and Frankie too. Yeah, I think he like them all. R.I.P. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> this is not a Jimmy Buffett podcast. <laughs> yeah, but a great, excellent segue. Uh, yeah, and uh, they kind of take away the whole tyrant uh, Axan Morgan thing. He doesn't. He doesn't rule he doesn't he doesn't feel like he he runs the town he doesn't rule with an iron axe yeah and wow you're you're much better with the analogies than i am <laughs> um like it, well, i mean like kind of like the the paintings and like the fascist looking posters i guess kind of do that subtly but yeah i realized in like the first episode he doesn't necessarily do anything wrong I think it's revealed he later sort, why he's I mean, corrupt. yeah, he sort of does. He is like, I mean, well, dude, you fucking beat up my... <laughs> yeah. like, I, I should punish you for this. And I think if you're like, yeah, whatever, that's reasonable. They definitely don't make him look super bad. I think it relies on the fact of you're going to need to know that Axan Morgan is a yeah, dickhead. Yeah, it's like Marines, opposite of pirates, therefore bad guys. Yeah. Or just opposing force at this point. So no. I... Again, the emotional gravity yeah. is taken away. Like he, the whole thing is like you know he's a bastard. It's not because he hits El Meppo. It's not because uh, not necessarily because he's like posting statues up of himself. Is when he finds out a little girl snuck onto the naval base and he's like, "You killed her, right?" And they're like, "No, she's just a girl." I'm like you kill her, and it's like, "Oh, this guy's a total asshole." Yeah, you don't really get that <laughs> with him here, but and I wonder, like you know. What they, I think a lot of this has to do with like time constraints um, and whatever they had to cut down. So mm-hmm. Part of me is like, damn, I wonder what they could have done with 10 episodes instead of eight. Right. Um, but more Kobe and Garp. <laughs> um, and the, an episode ends, we get, you know, modern day Garp and finding out that a pirate with a straw hat. Stole map of the Grand Line from that base. And then a man in a fedora is also there speaking lines and taking up screen. Oh, you mean Bogart? The character that's never been mentioned by name? Do you remember when I sent a picture of him to the group chat and I was like, why do people on TikTok make fan cams for this filler character? And Alex was like, he's not a filler character. He's not, but he needs it because there's, <laughs> there's he, he has more to do in this season of television than he has had in the actual canon story. You and that what? and that's if you're if you watch the anime. If you didn't watch the anime, Jesus. Yeah. Jesus, but you it. know what? Congrats to the Bogard heads or Bogard yeah. or whatever the fuck his They're name is. They're thriving. Yeah. What about the transponder snail heads? Okay, so can we talk the transponder snails? The scene of him feeding the lettuce and it's like well, that's in the second episode. Yeah. This makes for great rate radio right now, everybody. Yeah. Um, I was like disgusting that's awful but i do love the transponder cells i love that they're animatronic not and not animatronics uh what's the word they're, they're muppets they're, they're basically muppets. puppets I, think, I don't know if they're animatronics but can you do are, can they're... you do a kermit frog but kermit talking in a transponder cell or something no <laughs> <laughs> i won't <laughs> maybe later <laughs> Can you say? Can you be Kermit and say, 
<laughs> I'm gonna be king of the pirates. No, please. People have to. Yeah, people have to keep listening to this show if they want that. <laughs> okay, folks, I'm gonna get him to do more Kermit impressions. Sure. Can you say Fujoshi Friday as Kermit? No. <laughs> what I will say, we can move on to episode two. Episode two. I didn't take French. Neither did I. <laughs> How am I doing? Uh, you gotta ask the audience. How am I doing, audience? I will wait your opinion. I will not say. Yeah, anything tweet else. at Steve. Uh, hit at Steve Yurko if you um, like his pronunciation of French. So anyway, episode two. <laughs> it's called "The Man in the Straw Hat." Let's see, also directed by Mike. Um, sorry, directed by Mark Jobs. Uh, writers: uh, Ian Stokes, uh, Matt Owens, or no, just Ian Stokes on this one. This is uh, the buggy episode. So, I don't even give a shit about doing a play-by-play of what happened. I want which I don't don't want to do. It just it just has <laughs> oh, it just no, gives no, no, structure. It, sh- sh- it's okay. We can do it. I just first listen. It's probably one of my favorite episodes. Um, if if just for buggy, I think we have conflicting opinions about buggy because you think he's the fucking Joker, and I think he's Baby Girl Supreme. He's all over the place. That's what he is. But I'll you say know, this he is, can be. I think this is one of the best episodes. I don't want to. I don't want to spoil yet. But I do think this is like a strong contender for mm-hmm. best episode of the season. For sure. Um, is Jeff Ward his actor? Is that the name? We should have it in front of our of. I should. Yeah, I'm doing this off of my handy dandy phone here. Um, yeah, Jeff Ward. It's buggy. Um, Jeff Ward, call me. <laughs> he's <laughs> he's just okay all that said he's amazing as buggy he's, and i think what well, the the previous episode the stinger you know the last scene is setting up this episode with uh kabaji who is at the bar running back to buggy saying like all oh, these people stole the map oh they must have been playing this and it's, that was very funny and it's very joker vibes like very heath ledger very joaquin phoenix kind of vibes at the end and i'm kind of like i don't know i feel like they're able to successfully hold joker ified buggy and also manga buggy as we know him now in two floating detached hands um because they they manage to like they balance it you know you you get the okay he's a crazy little clown um and then they really knock him down to size by the end of the episode, and then we get some more. Literally, yeah, we get some uh, fun moments with him later on. Um, I think when we were saying, like, I remember saying to you, you know, I'll I'll wait to see if they do a, a bait and switch with him to see if he's goofier by the end. I how how much of it is buggy brained for me that well i mean like the over the head, his over first scene in this episode i think is a bait and switch because it's immediate comedy it's mm-hmm. it's he's just Boogie. pathetic yeah it's i i was immediately won over with his introduction in this episode when he's just complaining about how his little you know spotlight didn't work yeah. where's my lion yeah that Richie i just felt like that's saying like, where was the dancing lion? Which which most fans would be like, oh, oh he's talking, it's Richie because Richie's a character in the in the manga. He's a lion, and that just makes me think of cool. That's just another reminder that this is live action and that you can't do fun things like have a big lion <laughs> um, like you can in a cartoon. I, this is a genuine question: Are is like lions on set unethical now? Have we not figured out how to like they can't you know do chimpanzees I, or whatever because they kill people and go crazy yeah. can you do a lion well, or that, no? well that was a cg chimpanzee in nope so just saying. <laughs> i know i actually uh, i don't know i had my eyes I, closed the I, whole time i don't tend to see a lot of live animals anymore and stuff i, I think it's kind of unethical if it is unethical i'm like i'm all with it oh I'm not that i wanted them to have like an actual lion there i thought yeah they my whole point like was a... like the line is yes it's a nod to like the source material but it's almost like it's reminding me like oh yeah this can't do as many fun things they should have panned over to a little kitty cat <laughs> That's the dancing uh, he he is hilarious and i think one of my favorite lines from the whole show is you know he's like and i've been trying to get that the map of the grand line from axan moron, moron. Eh? that's a good one yeah eh. 
Like yeah. that was immediately I'm like, oh, this is genius. Mm-hmm. This is so funny. Genius it's, Dexter. Yeah. <laughs> Bucky the Clown. Because he's like, because Bucky's trying so hard to be cool in, in the context of the yes. show, I should say. Because, you know, that's a way to my heart is like just being relatable and uh, mm-hmm. and, a, and, a, and a fuck up. You, you love bad puns. Um, I... Now, my, he also delivers my favorite line of, of the show. <laughs> Zoro and Nami escape, and we get a, where are my freaks? I'm going to get such traction That's gonna get my out of for that. Years. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the whole different thing is now it's like they they have Orange Town captive as a captive audience, literally mm-hmm. chained up. Um, yeah, the whole... It just totally changed it. In- well, the, yeah, it's it, now he's like, I mean, he's always been kind of like a dickhead, abusive captain in the early days. Well, I mean, even now he just lies to like people that serve under him. But he's, you know, he talks about Luffy. It's like, you know, it's like, I'll be known, you know, I'll be loved. And that's like, that's his whole gimmick is um, he tries to force that out of people. While Luffy doesn't, you know, Luffy and Shanks, and we get the second half of the Shanks flashback too. Mm-hmm. It's they're two, they're from two different worlds where you know they kind of like Luffy comes from a world where you know uh, admiration, you know, uh, respect isn't you know isn't uh, uh, expected. It's expect- earned. It, it's earned. Yes. Um, meanwhile, Buggy is the complete opposite of that, holding people hostage, shooting people like shit. And and that's like because East Blue has always been kind of the villains are all foils for Luffy. They're all foils of different aspects of Luffy, mm-hmm. and that's where I felt like this succeeded there. Um, even when I thought like, oh, they don't do the thing about like ah oh, treasure and all that, but there's the scene, you know, like when you know Luffy spits up the the Grand Line map. Remember that he deep throated. <laughs> <laughs> he sure did. Um, Zoro taught him well, but. <laughs> <laughs> but Luffy's um, priorities are instead of going for the map, you know, which everyone's fighting over, he goes for his hat first. Yes. I thought that was a really nice way of doing that motif without necessarily Absolutely. saying it out loud. Um, but, yeah. I think um, Zoro and Nami had, had, I liked their little stuck together. Um, putting Nami in a birdcage, my roommate and I were like, okay, we get it. She's a woman. The the caged bird motif, whatever, it's fine. Um, but they had some some interesting moment like talks. Uh, Kabaji being like, "You killed my mother." Okay, I was yeah. like, "What the?" Fuck Kabaji is that, gets though? the backstory that nobody asked for, and I think nobody cares about. <laughs> I, I, but, I, mean, I know he's already a ridiculous character. He's a guy who rides around on a unicycle, but unicycles are a very professional tool of entertainment. That should be respected oh, as such. At? Your mom's house. This, wow. <laughs> this is what it's like doing a podcast with a 12 year old. I bet you thought Zoro should have killed Kaido. I'm 14, Kaido actually. Too. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was kind of like something that was added where I was like, yeah, I could tell you really wanted to make people care more, but I don't think you really needed to. Um, we. Didn't talk. We we went straight for Buggy. I want to talk about the little Luffy and Nami ch- yeah. chest scene. That was so fucking that. cute. I'm uh, circling back around. Yeah, but like the scenes of the Straw Hats together, like I truly think that's where the show needed to like succeed in. Like this is where you have to nail it. Everything else will fall into place mm-hmm. as long as you get the main. As long as you get the Straw Hats and their chemistry down. And I really enjoy all their scenes together. Like. Nami trying to crack open that uh, that safe, and she's listening in. And then Luffy puts his head on top of hers, trying to listen into her adorable stuff. Yeah, like that's exactly the type of energy the two of them would have. Siblings, yeah. almost. Mm-hmm. Uh, Zoro in the back trying to take a nap. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, that's it's a really that's a really great opening uh, to the episode. We didn't talk about all about how like. Uh, the Kobe stuff is ongoing. And the Kobe, because uh, I, some people I know re- think like really, really liked the Kobe and Garp stuff. I 
for the most part, found it to be my least favorite part of of the series. I mm. just didn't find myself engaged at all. I found myself kind of bewildered, like, why are we doing this? It, it just felt like, okay, we need to have like an overarching villain or something for the whole season, which a B I, plot. I'm I'm like, okay, maybe this is like because of the Netflix model, like they have to make the season feel cohesive. Um but I feel like that's what our long was. I didn't need mm-hmm. Garp. I, think I, it- I, I was fun having a little ca- if we had like just had a little cameo and then like doing a little training, but I don't know. Well, I, I didn't. Ca- it, they didn't convince me to care about it. Well, I was gonna get upset because I feel like Kobe gets shafted in his arc where he has his moment of growth, his character development. You know, kind of sticking up for himself. Uh, not being afraid to die when Helmepo has a gun to his head. Uh, all that's kind of gone. He just disappears for a while. And then he shows back up when Helmepo tries to stop Luffy and the gang from escaping. And then Kobe just uh, cold cocks him. And I don't know where the hell he was during the rest of that. And it, and it kind of just like, and then Kobe just like, I'm just going to stay here. And it kind of doesn't feel... Like it almost it seems like uh, this place is a, sh- a shithole. Why are you gonna stay here? You know, it's like this place is corrupt. Uh, but it gets continued in this episode, and like Garp shows up, and uh, what's it say? And like, and like he particularly like like latches on to like Kobe. He like knows there's more to it than that. And then like they eventually interview him, and they figure him out that you know he had previous like he was associated with the pirates that had invaded the base and all that, and was like. And uh, telling the truth is a core value of the Marines. And that's why Morgan is corrupt. is because he lies, apparently. He lies a lot. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I guess that works. It... I don't know. I just didn't... But the, the... I, I couldn't tell you, like, conversations that happened in the scene because it was just kind of forgettable for me, mm-hmm. so... Well, you've seen the whole series now, and we'll have to like go back. But like the the Kobe yeah. and Garp stuff is ongoing, so we'll talk about more of that later. Um, how do you think they handled his um, Buggy's torture scene of of artistic vision was so funny. Again, they like they landed it because you know normally I'd be like, "Girl, what the fuck is going on?" Um, but I think they managed to toe the line of of camp well for buggy i don't know if they were going for campy but they certainly landed there i think for buggy they certainly are yeah and what i mean though is like i still kind of get joker vibes from him because he definitely acts very joker later mm-hmm. on when he's like torturing luffy when he's got luffy in like the water chamber or he kidnaps the kid in the audience yeah uh he totally does when he does like the little finger twirl thing yes uh what was the always, one like, line someone is like you know my map or whatever or it, it's totally heath ledger doing that with the knife at the the party uh in the dark night uh and what were you asking i'm trying to remember what, what the exact line was where he's like pain leads to art yeah when he's like, I- art leads to truth. There's, I'm like, see when I eat something that gives me a tummy ache. <laughs> it's that, yeah, that was that was some interesting dialogue from Buggy there. Trying to was it was it giving too much depth for Buggy, or do you think that's camp? I I liked it. Mm. I think he just he sounds crazy. I'm like, what are you talking about right mm. now? And then I think him being like, oh, it's all about the truth. He wants to, you know, it was I, whatever his motivations were to be doing it in the first place. He eventually gets it out of Luffy because yeah. oh. it's like a weird segue to get him to talk about how he knows Shanks or whatever. Yeah. Instead of him just being able to be like, wait a minute, I know that hat. Yeah, but whatever. False idol, maybe is that how he, he called him a false. Who, who did you worship? A false idol. I'm like, okay, that's how that's how a lot of you people treat Shanks. Mm-hmm. Um, for a man that probably doesn't bathe more than once a week. <laughs> how do you think they handled the rest of the Shanks stuff with, uh, you know, fighting the bandits and I liked Lord it. Of the Coast? I I enjoyed the little red hair pirates kicking ass scene. I thought mm-hmm. that was kind of fun. Um, oh. 
I gotta complain again. Um, how the... It is 2023. We are allowed to write characters who are fat and not every fucking joke that... Not every line of dialogue about them has to be about how they love to eat food or how fat they are. I'm gonna talk about Lucky Rue. They did that a couple times to the point that, like, I was like, what... What are we doing here? Right, they didn't do it with Alveda. No, is... they didn't do it with Alveda, which I appreciated. So then it threw me off guard and did it with Lucky Rue. I mean, maybe that's in his character in the in the manga, I guess. It just seemed weird He's for them to... always seen eating a piece of meat. Yeah, but always eating a piece of meat is like a little bit different. It's like the visual gag, I guess. But like, it's a little bit different than straight up being like, don't let the... You know, with the, well, the we've got enough Rue supplies eats. for a full, you know, for a couple of weeks, but with Lucky Rue, will be lucky if it lasts a week or something like right. that. And I'm like, okay, it's not the worst thing, but I get where you're coming at. I was just, it's, it's just a criticism that I have had. It's probably with other th- things, but I specifically remember other Netflix series that I have followed where they just fucking love to make fat people a joke, and I'm like, why are we? Come on. Mm-hmm. I don't know. And that's that is a criticism that extends beyond one piece. I just thought about it and it bothered me. I like the sea monster. Sea monster <laughs> did look cool. It did look good. I'm trying to see Shanks a sea monster. <laughs> <laughs> you like that well, one? It was a good thing Laura the Coast didn't bite that off. Um No, he just you know, mm. he's still got two arms left. <laughs> No, he says All he's, got, he's got one arm and three legs. <laughs> uh, God, I we're, we're gross. I'm gross. I I like the scene. You know, the, the way they were able to film this, where it makes sense, is Shanks is on this little dinghy mm-hmm. on this boat with Luffy the entire time. Uh, I would say his. Di- yeah, I, 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 as soon as I said dinghy, I knew I, what I was walking into there. Um, and you know, we got the. You know, the scene of Shanks uh, passing the hat on to Luffy. And then there's a line of dialogue that has not sat well with me. Because for the most part, I'm like, cool, this nails it. What? Oh, the, the, the whole thing with this um, this flashback, I forgot, it's in the first episode. Shanks' whole thing about being a good pirate. Oh, yeah. That was weird. And... And this is the, uh, well, you should read the book. I realize I'm like, oh, this series now is me. I'm the, you should read the book guy. It's like, it was better, uh, better in the book. Me but, with Howl's Moving Castle. <laughs> man, this is, and this is my Howl's, I guess. Yeah. Well, Luffy's whole thing, Luffy's not about being a hero. It sometimes aligns with his motivations because often he's doing it for friends or he's doing it just because it's too messed up, but he doesn't want to be a hero. He's even said. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be the hero. Heroes have to share their meat. Yep. I don't want to share my meat. Luffy's all about freedom. And that's the same thing with Shanks, too. The The whole thing, what drives a lot of people to be pirates is the freedom. But I think the rest of the world, when you talk about pirates, people immediately think of, you know, the pillaging, the really dodgy kind of pirates. They, you know, they're mostly seen as bad guys. Uh, that's the conception to most of the world. So I think it feels like the show had to like nail in like, no, we have to distinguish the difference between the, the, you know, the typical bad pirates everyone thinks of and the good pirates that star in our show. Yeah. So that kind of becomes this whole plot point of the show is being a good pirate. Cause even Luffy, makes, and, Luffy and Kobe have the exchange, uh, be a good Marine, be a good pirate. It makes the audience feel dumb. Like, I feel like we're being talked down to with that line. It does, in a way, I got to say. It kind of feels like, hey, uh, you know, nobody make a fuss. And, you know, and then, you know, eventually things will resolve themselves, you know. I don't, like, I, it doesn't ruin the show, but it, it that becomes the thing. <laughs> that it, that becomes, like, an ongoing theme. It's just, it's it's one of those things where I was like, again, I have to hold my mind uh, what, was required to be added to become like a live action Western Mm -hmm. media. I don't know. Um, I know it really, it probably sounds like we're ragging on this a lot. The parts, and and these are just like the small things that really stood out to me. I enjoyed watching it. Like when I'm sitting there watching it, I'm having a great time, having a blast. Mm -hmm. I like really enjoy it. It's just when I sit down and I think about it, I'm like, yeah, kind of why that was a weird choice. It's tough because I have to turn off my 
unfortunate extensive knowledge of the series <laughs> enjoy this and i do enjoy watching it um actually that didn't well that's happen. the thing i, I i'm like <laughs> i don't want to become the oh, you, the book was better mm-hmm. and that's my thing but i'm trying but you gotta look at it. this is episode two i'm like does this tell a cohesive story that's entertaining yeah yeah i think so i think whether you're a fan of one piece or not and that's the big thing is like this this live action series is meant to you know uh it's supposed to bring in a new audience people that haven't given this a chance and of course at this point it seems to be working a lot of people that yes. have that don't want to get into one piece are are trying this live action out and it and it seems to be working i have many friends who were like i'm never going to touch one piece who are really into the live action now and i'm like yay that and, makes and me happy. They like buggy um i have not heard buggy reports yet they should like Buggy. My mom doesn't like Buggy. That's disappointing. But she does. She just doesn't know. She doesn't no. know him like I do. Because you know what? I didn't like Buggy at first. Did I ever tell you what happened when I was first reading the manga? I uh, lost the volume in the middle of me reading it. And I was like, well, that guy's fucking stupid anyway. And we're not going to, you know... I. He's not ever going to come back. And obviously, Luffy be- beats him. I mean, that's how it used to be. Like, that's like, uh-huh. that's so then I just thing. skipped over to, what to like the volume four, I think was next. You know, I missed the chapter when Zoro fought Mihawk, and I just assumed Zoro beat Mihawk. <laughs> that's really funny. 20 something chapters or whatever into the series. And yeah, Zoro already accomplishes his dream. And you're like, okay. Yeah. Uh, and then I think I got to Impel Down, and I was like, what the hell? And then I went back. You don't remember found- him showing up in Logtown? No, sorry, you're right. Yes, Log Town. What the hell? Uh, but then I was like, okay, well, he's probably gone for real now. And then and back he shows in- up in Jai. Shut <laughs> up! <laughs> I wasn't until uh, Impel Down that I was like, okay, I guess I need more context for this dickhead. And then I went back and read, and I was like, oh, he's funny. Yeah. And I found the volume. It had fallen between my bed and <laughs> the wall, and I, well, I fell asleep reading or something. So it's funny stuff. I was a, I'm a fake buggy fan. I had to circle back around. No, that's to okay. It. You're more like an enlightened buggy. Uh, fan. Yeah, you I came back around. Yes. Yeah. The the Ariana Grande bundles and Impel Down really possessed <laughs> me. <laughs> but overall, I'd say these are two very two very entertaining episodes of television. Um, I forgot to mention snail pods. <laughs> were they oh yeah they are in this one um Nami I, then. apparently nami's up to no good and then yeah the, the snail pods i ran into the group chat posted spoilers without tagging them and was like snail pods yeah yeah because that and really Zach ruined yelled at me yeah because that really he said i ruined his engagement no, yeah i totally like that the snail pods is really what uh holds the show together i mean what are we gonna do without I mean, snail pods. That's such an important you part of the call series. Me on my snail phone, like now when I need. But it's good, you. right? These two episodes, it's yeah, good. Oh yeah, yeah. these were strong. I I quite enjoyed them. It, you know, I had my like confusion as it like changes, but besides that, it this great. I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. I um, I'm excited to watch this with my little brother who likes One Piece, and I'm excited that like it's getting friends into One Piece. I think that's so cool. But I think it's really great because, you know, it introduces, you know, two opposing forces, I think, very well. You know, the pirates and the marines. And we get the differences. We get pirates like Luffy. And then we get the douchebag pirates like Buggy. Uh, and it's just, I got to say, like, it's pretty entertaining. and I th- and th- And I think that's, you know, huge thanks, you know, major part. Due to the actors and the writing, oh yeah, and the I writers. Think the, the greatest parts of the show are are just the little bits of the Straw Hats interact, interacting with each other. That's like not the main plot. I find myself most entertained by that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah, it's the stuff I've always liked about One Piece. Not the you know, not necessarily the the badass punches or sword fighting and all that. Uh, it's always a plus, but I think you know, uh, unfortunately. When people ask me like what I think of it, I feel like the first words out of your mouth is like, it's not bad because we're so used to live action being bad. bad. 
<laughs> well. Or just completely being like, that's okay. We we don't have to like take all the things that made this work. We'll just like take the skeleton of it and then just make our own thing out of yeah, it, which is kind of what they made the dead. That's what they did with like Death Note. And like, I feel like a lot of like. Speaking of musicals, go watch Death Note the musical on Broadway right now. No, it's in London actually. No. Well, it's actually a banger. Really? Yeah. I got to play a song for you later. I guess they should really do that One Piece musical next. They got to do the One Piece musical. <laughs> well, they did do the Kabuki play. So. Yeah, but. I Sorry, wouldn't. Mike. I think, oh, a musical is. Yeah, it's it's like oh my god, it's like it, One Piece can be adapted into live action. They did One so Piece fun. on Ice. It's time. If any producers out there who I don't know shit about music, but consult me for something. I think that's that's what this podcast is really uh, pitching. This is yeah, this is a ploy for us to. Be, oh, hold on, I'm gonna uh, while while we wrap up here, you you keep talking. I'm gonna think of some some things. You keep talking. Okay. Well, I mean, we could uh, we could go to our next segment, and we could give you some time to think, and then we'll come back, and you know, then we'll sign off, and we'll yeah, figure out that's how to perfect. Do that. Yeah. Okay. Shall we? <laughs> uh, yeah, I haven't thought of a funny. I'll take it from here. <laughs> <laughs> well. That'll do it for our first installment of an extra podcast talking about the One Piece live action series with real human actors acting out One Piece. Not singing it, though. Not singing on the streaming service Netflix for your viewing pleasure. Catchy title. But that's what we're doing here on this actual podcast. Uh, Vera and I will hopefully be covering the next batch. I think we'll just cover during like arc, an arc at a time. Yeah, so I think uh, it'll be like four episodes worth. Like three, I think. Yeah, because we'll do Syrup Village next, which is about three episodes. You're holding out on Baratier. Oh, but I want to uh, talk about. Yeah, you gotta you gotta eat your veggies so you could enjoy your uh your entree. dessert. Yeah, or dessert, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> I just realized like entree and veggies, you could have those together. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got to eat my Dessert. vegetables before I get to have my. Um, yeah. You wouldn't eat your side my, salad. My Sanji's entirely. lollipop. Yeah. <laughs> and you wouldn't have like your side salad entirely before starting on your steak. So. <laughs> well, we'll work on our analogies too. But yeah, it's been fun uh, talking about the series. Uh, if somehow you still haven't watched it yet, hopefully this is some encouragement to check it out. Or hopefully, if you've been enjoying it, uh, you share our sentiments. And even if the things, yeah, or maybe even the things that bug you are the same things that bug us. Uh, we want to hear about what you agree <laughs> on. With I'm us. trying to hear about the bug e, not the bug us. <laughs> I'm confused. It's okay. Don't don't worry about it. It was a bad one. Cool. That, that one was a. Abyss. And you know where to find us, onepiece.com, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Uh, the show is on the One Piece Podcast. Uh, social media, One Piece Podcast. Email us at onepiecepodcast at gmail.com. What's the phone number? I don't know. Maji. Maji. <laughs> it's 497 something something. Six two five four. Cut this. Uh I'm I can't remember the Soldier Boy song. Oh my god. Too bad. Kiss me through the phone. Anyway, you can find Steve at Steve Yurko at most places these days. You can find me at Twitter on uh, Kinko Crown Arts. X Twitter. Whatever you want to call it. The bird app. The bird app. It's still a bird for me. The X app. Mm. But yeah. The you X could... app is just what you call like hinge. Don't worry about it. Follow us on your social media of choice. I'll say that. <laughs> at Steve Yurko, at Ginkgo Crown Arts, or Ginkgo Crown everywhere else besides Twitter. Yeah. Fuck you, Elon Musk. Yep. Bye. Yeah. We'll catch you on the next one. Uh, talking more about 
One Piece reenacted with actual people. Who are not singing and not on ice. And not cartoons in front of a camera for your streaming Buggy pleasure. should have had a musical number. I'm just saying. It could happen. It could happen. All right, bye. Bye.